troops. And so, you know, it's got to set the ambiance. Oh, nice. Oh, where are you? Uh, I'm in uh, Brasada Ranch. It's east of Bend. Oh, up in Oregon. Yeah. Hey, thanks for doing this on your vacation. So it's early for you too. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a early I'm I'm a dad and a business owner, so early is uh, early is the normal. Yeah, you know, um, it, it, I like the way you said that I'm a dad too because that was one of the things I realized pretty early on. Having kids, you got to get up before them, or else then it feels like yeah you're chasing them the whole day. If you can get up ahead of them and like get a couple things done, you know, like the pizza from the night before put away or pick up shoes that are around the house or read or just anything. Right. I mean, then you're like, you're Sitting ahead of them. quiet. Right. That too. That too. Yeah. Um, I heard about you, uh, through, uh, Chris Cooper and he said Good you dude. were, yeah, he is a great dude, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He is. He's, he's everything. Everybody thinks he is and um he well said and he said um that you were running your um gym with a different model than a lot of people and he said mm -hmm. hey it may it may really interest you so then I, I looked at your instagram and i said wow you've really you've you've i, I don't know if reinvented yourself but i but i just like everything you're doing is is, is home for you oregon it is not no i'm from i'm from rural massachusetts oh Okay. And that, and that's where all this is taking place that I see on your Instagram, your gym, your training, all that stuff, your people. That that's in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, so we're in the kind of the South side of Portland, right down near Multnomah village. Okay. So that's home for you now. So you're a West coast guy now. Correct. And, and, and were you a physician to begin with? No. So my background, so, um, my schooling started with, uh, education in surgery when I was really young in about 20 uh, and uh, that evolved into being a surgical first assistant. And I did that for many years. And then I um, kind of honed down and subspecialized into transplant medicine. Um, and I did a bunch of dissection work and then kind of the, the pre-transplant work on the donation side of things. And then I did a lot of clinical work on that side. So throughout that process, um, I got a degree in neuroscience um, and so I'm not a, a, a physician. Um, the area of expertise I have is extremely small. There's very few people um, that get educated in that because there's very few people that it can be organ donors. And so that's that took about 20 years of my life um, of what uh, where I focused all my attention. I think that the new chief marketing officer at CrossFit Inc., mm -hmm. this lady named Jenna Haka, if I remember correctly, I think she got her degree in neuroscience from Princeton. Wow. I think I remember hearing that. Yeah, it, it, I, I think now you're the only two people I've ever known, or I, I don't know her, but the only two people I've heard of who have a degree in neuroscience. What a trip, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it sounds real fancy, but, you know, it's just – it. it it educates me in something that's obsolete 10 years later because we learn more about the brain so rapidly and we realize how little we know. So I'm obsolete now. <laughs> uh, take, take me back to uh, 19 years old that led up to what you did. Um, you, you were helping with surgeries at 20. Tell me how you got it, got to that yeah, spot. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I, it was actually on a bet. So I come from a blue collar family. I come from a really old dairy farm in Western Massachusetts. It's the oldest one on the East coast, uh, believe it or not still operating. And so we always worked with our hands and I got into a, a little bit of a scuffle bet with a construction guy that I worked with. And he said, I would never amount to anything. And I just pulled up the next thing in medicine and applied and got into it. And that was the surgical first assistant program. And that's really what spawned my medical career. And I just turned out to absolutely love it. Um, and so I, I studied that. And then I worked in the community hospital there for two years. And then I traveled around the country for another three and a half years, mostly working in um, orthopedics. So bones, muscles, tendons, uh, trauma, um, things of that nature and some pretty large institutions all the way out to Stanford and then, then back to the East Coast at some bigger places there and then i transitioned into being a surgical dissector for a uh, organ donation uh team in boston which is a, a relatively large organization um 
focusing a lot more on cardiovascular and cardiac dissection. Uh, and then my wife finished up her, my wife's a lot smarter than I am. My wife finished up, uh, her PhD when we were in Boston and then we moved to the Bay area, which is where she's originally from. We lived, uh, Walnut Creek for a while. And I took a position, um, at the transplant organization there. What's the name of the transplant organization in, in Walnut Creek? Uh, donor network West. Okay. Um, and then, um, I worked in there, um, more in a managerial role. And then I switched over the, to the clinical side and the, the clinical side is where I really took off and started learning a lot. Um, and so in the clinical side, you do medical management of, um, unstable, uh, potential organ donors, uh, once the family consents. And so it's a high energy, high triage situation, which is where I really like, uh, kind of, uh, had, a, had our first child in the Bay, um, and just all the things that are the Bay with, you know, a lot of traffic and cost of living and things of that nature. Um, we started looking around, I took a position at OHSU, which is the big medical institution in Portland. Um, let's see, I've been. And she went up seven. there with you and she went up there with you. Yeah. She's always worked remote. Um, she's, she's worked remote since, I mean, she took her first job out of, out of, uh, her PhD was, um, as a medical director for a pharmaceutical company in, in, um, Boston. And then from there she switched companies and worked remote ever since. Um, so she has the flexibility to kind of go wherever. Did, did um, she go to Northgate? Do you know what high school she went to? Uh, she went to Gilroy high. Oh, wow. Okay. So she grew yeah. up in Gilroy and then ended up, uh, in, in Walnut Creek. Yeah, she went to Gilroy and then she went to, she did her undergrad at San Jose state and then she did her, uh, PhD out in Boston. Interesting. Uh, Gilroy's gone through quite a bit of changes in the last 30 years, but still pretty, pretty sure rural. has. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. Is, is she bilingual? Does she speak Spanish? She does. Her mother's um, was born in Mexico. Um, she's not fluent, but mostly because it's because she's out of practice. But she she speaks Spanish a lot better than I do. That's for sure. Her fa her family came. Uh, is her dad Mexican also? No, her dad's 100% German. It's her, her oh, dad's you know, six foot five, and her, her mom's you know five foot three. Um, Where did they meet? Just out of curiosity. So they met. I, I it was either in Indiana or or Norfolk because uh, her father was in the uh, Navy. Um, okay, okay, and I'm I'm not sure. I think they met at Indiana University, if I remember correctly, and then they kind of went it went out to the military path, and then came out to the Bay Area. There's this, uh, Dan, there's this German, I think it's German. I can't remember who the guest was I had on, but there's this German tribe and I forget what, like, I don't know if sect is the right word, but they live South of the border somewhere in Mexico. They're kind of like Amish. And, and, and that's why I was wondering if when, when you said uh, her dad was German, I was like, Oh, I wonder if they met uh, through there. I wonder what that is. Maybe someone in the comments will tell us what that is. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So her, she's, she's, uh, were her parents first uh, generation here? They were immigrants. They came up to work her, in Gilroy. Her mother was. Yep. Her mother yeah. was. So there, her mother was, her mother was born in Mexico. Her family went back down to Mexico when her father got sick. Her, both of her mother's parents were right from Mexico. They went back down to Mexico. She was born in Mexico. Her father, her mother's father. So her grandfather passed away in Mexico. And then her mom came back to the United States and they went to Indiana. So, you know, kind of central, um, and then, um, you know, kind of messed around around there for a while. And then she met, uh, Greg, who's, um, my wife's father in the military and then came out to the, came out to Gilroy after that. Hey, uh, congratulations, by the way, you are a beautiful human being, but you also scored an incredibly sounds like smart and beautiful wife. And then now you guys have two beautiful kids. So, yeah, we get, we had a pretty great life. Yeah, good job. That's that's the that's the way to do it. Sure is. Um, Level up. So so you get into this. Uh, you get right. You get into this um, argument with a guy. He talks shit to you at nineteen. Uh, uh, basically, he's calling you a dummy who works in a dairy farm. You're like, I'll fucking show you. And uh, you you launch off and start filling your brain with smart stuff. That's yeah. That's the. There's no no other story besides that. Yeah, interesting. And it, it's uh, uh, Jason Kalipa has a similar story. It's interesting when he was in high school um, at a senior graduation, 
the principal made it cracked a joke about him about being a dummy it's yeah and, and it's so and, I... it, and it stung and he and he and he's he's like okay i'll show you and you know it, it, as much as the ego gets a bad rap there is a time to leverage the ego yeah see i I love the ego in that regard. And, and you gotta, you have to, you know, run the fine line of being like, well, you're a dick or you're like, you know, you're just trying to get what you know that you're capable of. Right. I mean, we've got to have something that's internal, that's motivating you. So I don't, I don't mind that. I mean, I had a similar thing there at my guidance counselor. I remember sitting down in her office when I was a, a senior in high school and she, I still remember her name. She said, Dan, some kids just aren't meant to go to college. Yeah, I, and it was just like I had a college professor like, tell me that. <laughs> watch this, yeah. you know. Um, then ha I had no idea, you know, what I was going to do or nothing. I just knew that um, I could figure things out. Um, I uh, Matt Matt Souza, the guy, the executive producer of this show, he also has a similar story. Um, I'd like to hear it in more detail sometime. But basically, pe people saying he's never going to amount to anything. He's basically, you know, belongs on the yellow bus. And then he said that made him really insecure. And when he opened his first CrossFit gym, he didn't want to get caught off guard, not knowing about business. So he consumed a hundred business books and, uh, and they stuck. He realized, Oh, that's actually my calling. This information is sticky. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. It's, it's super cool when that happens. Like we get, so we, we just pulled my daughter out of uh, public school and she's in a, in a, private school that's a stem based school so it's much more hands on arts focused things of that nature because the the education kids get in it, it just kind of puts them in pockets like this is the only way to do it and and when you when you have that ability to be creative in the way you learn it doesn't matter if you're 8 like my oldest or 43 like me once you figure out how you learn if you have the the ego and the confidence that I'm going to go against conventional style and I'm still going to be successful um, I think that's super powerful. Was there a specific incident that happened that, uh, had you make the switch with your daughter? Um, well, without going down the rabbit hole of Portland politics, um, yeah. the, the, our school, so the P, we're in the PPS school system and they were on a com entire month strike for the entire month of November. So our kids did not step foot in the school of 2023. Um, yeah. Okay. And then um, they started to try to make up some difference in taking, they took out their first week of vacation, which everybody had already had stuff planned. And then we had that big ice storm somewhere in January and our, my daughter's school hasn't been updated in forever. I don't want to misquote it, but in excess of 30 years and they burst some pipes and a whole bunch of asbestos went all over the school. And so they closed that school completely. And, and, you know, my, my kids in second grade and there was, a hundred kids in that class and, you know, housing K through six. So simple math tells you it's at least 600 kids that they dispersed between all the other schools. So they were already overpopulated. And then they had no idea when they were potentially going to open that school. And at that stage, we were like, okay, we just cannot have this, this inconsistency. She'd essentially been in school six or eight weeks for the first two quarters of, of the school. And so, we needed to to make the investment and it was it it has been the best investment it's the best decision i've ever made as a, as a parent is putting her in this school um, isn't it so. isn't it fascinating my um i've spent uh many hours on this show um slamming uh the state of oregon especially the portland school system and mm -hmm. and the california school system it is it, it, it i mean it's abusive it's, it's almost like if you hate your kids, you leave them in school. But um, we pulled our kid out after one year. So basically, mm -hmm. basically the, um, the COVID happened and we saw the way they were treating the kids. And then when we came back, there were all sorts of the George Floyd had happened. And so all sorts of weird social policies started getting in place that were inappropriate for uh, second graders, first graders, second, anyone, anyone just in school, period. Like there were just all sorts of things being talked about that were being projected onto these kids that was like completely inappropriate shit that maybe their parents should be talking about or the things that should happen naturally in a kid's life. And so whether it was the, uh, uh, 
yeah, we pulled them out and dude, a hundred percent, the greatest thing we ever did. And, and my two youngest kids have never went to school. And there are some really, I know that they're sort of biased narratives, but, um, people are having kids. And then for the first 15, no, 18 years of their life, sending them to be put behind chain link fences for nine hours a day. And I, I know that's a pretty, uh, <laughs> biased and simplistic view but when i drive by these schools with my kids that's what i see i see kids behind chain link fences and i'm like wow uh like yeah it's the greatest thing yeah it's it's we're we're really grateful that, that we have the financial means to be able to do it and and the the wherewithal and the timing was great um did you have to yeah, give anything we, up when you say you had the financial means did you have to give anything up did you have to change things or um, I gave up coaching a little bit so that we could make sure that, cause we have to, uh, drop her off at school now and that drop off's a little larger, but as far as like, um, I still get my coffee in the morning if, if that's what you're talking about. We, we're pretty, um, we're pretty frugal with our money in the sense of we don't buy a lot of things outside of experiences. So my house isn't full of like a bunch of junk. We, we, we buy experiences. So for that, when that happened, we were we were replaced. And to be honest, I mean, we were been paying daycare for the last mm. years. It's already, it's like, all right, well, it's just going to go in perpetuity or at least for the next eight years. And, and you um, have a younger son also. I do. Yeah. My son Cole is uh, about four and a half. Uh, well, he'll correct me for nine months. And, and what are you going to do? What, what's the plan for him to go to the same school as the, as the, daughter? yeah, he's, yeah. he's already, the application's already submitted. We, our 60 day notice is given so we'll transition him uh in june or july so he won't um he won't come into the pps school system and it's it's just the right thing for our family you know we um we recognize that and 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 we're so so happy that we're able to to provide that for for our kids in this situation hey this this notion that you said where you and your wife buy experiences um that's cool that you see eye to eye on that right yeah, we're, that's what makes relationships work. It's the best relationship I've ever had, like in my entire life. It's we, uh, our relationship was very fast tracked. I mean, we were living together within a couple of months. Um, and then, um, you know, we were married shortly thereafter. I don't, I mean, we both are, are not so great with important dates like that. Uh, but we've been married for, I think it's 13 years this year, 13 or 14 years. Um, and we we don't have disagreements about money we 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 don't we've always had the same bank account even back when we were you know just dating and and we've always invested in um experiences and and really to be honest that's it like and it's just continued once we had kids so once we had kids instead of traveling all over the world we bought a a, a camper van and so now we travel all over the place we don't we don't ever we don't ever fly to California anymore. We just drive. So my, my kids and, and my wife are going to um, Martinez. I'm headed to Vegas for a business conference with Two Brain on Wednesday. Ah. They're going to drive down to California in the camper van. And then um, I'll fly in to meet them after the conference for the weekend. And then we'll drive back. I mean, so we just invested in, you know, a, a vessel that allows us to take everything in our, in our puppy and their bikes. And that's just what we do. So we spend most weekends out at the mountain or up in Washington or out at the coast. Um, we just continue to do that instead of um, by, you know, some people like material things. We like experiences. What is, I, it's, I grew up in Martinez. I grew up in Pacheco, the city right next to it. Pacheco. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, um, and, and my mom, where it was uh, an attorney, uh, K uh, Martinez is the uh, county seat for Contra Costa County. So she worked in Martinez for years. What, what, oh, are, what What's your wife doing down there? Uh, so her, so her sister lives in Martinez, her sister and their family live in Martinez. And then, um, she's got, a another sister and her parents live down in, uh, Los Panos down wow. here. I've been yeah. to, to, uh, uh, the weightlifters gym a few times. Um, oh, oh, Graciano's. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've, cool. I've chatted with him a couple of times. Um, and so we go down to, to the Bay area, you know, four or five times a year. Um, wow. What a so small world. Hang out. Yeah. Um, this, uh, this career you had as a, um, um, so d dairy farmer and then, uh, fast track through school 
and then into neuroscience and then specifically around uh, transplants. You did that for um, how many years until, did you do? Were you in that business? Until like I was 20 years? 40, yeah. So let's see. I, I, started, um, I started in the OR uh, when I was 22. That was my first clinical. And then I was specifically focused in trans or organ donation into transplantation from 27 to about 40. I still do some consulting with the local company, uh, more around operations, not surgical operations, but operations and systems. Um, but right up till I was 40, um, the, the latter part of my career there, I spent um, building kind of education criteria and educating a lot of the new uh, clinical staff coming in with for the company. Um, and so, yeah, long, long time. So 13 years in organ donation specifically. Hey, okay. Organ donations. Um, but can you ba basically, you can transplant anything, right? I mean, I, I don't hear about the brain being transplanted, but like, yeah, I mean, it, they'll try it anything now, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, and it depends like what they're transplanting it for. But as far as like solid organs, like some solid organs, they're not going to transplant. They're not going to transplant a spleen, um, for instance. Um, and you what's know, the deal with the spleen? Organs, Why not a spleen? What's the spleen? It just you you don't need it nearly as it's not a vital oh, organ per okay. se. Now that doesn't mean that you want to go messing around with it because it's hypervascular. So you know, think crazy things can happen, and there are other physiological things that can happen with it, but. Um, you, you don't necessarily need it to live just like you only need one kidney to live, right? You only need one lung. You, you can live with half a liver, like things of that nature. And so, um, it kind of depends if you're talking about whole organ or if you're talking about, you know, a, a, an ACL graph or a skin graph or a corneal graph, or there's, you know, there's, you can, you can do what all about sorts eyeballs? of things. Has, it, has an mm -hmm. eyeball ever been transplanted? Yeah. So that's the corneal graph where they'll, will you know, you'll take the cornea out of the, of the eye. That's they, it's the most common, it's probably the most common, um, asystolic recovery. So once the patient has passed and there's no longer a heartbeat, whether it be, you know, medically stabilized or, you know, on their own stabilized, um, corneas are definitely the most common thing recovered. What um, about a tongue? And, Is it a tongue transplant? That'd probably be kind of hard just because of all the sensation and the mucous membranes. I mean, you could do it, but it'd probably be like a, a piece of leather in your mouth and not functioning. And not fun and it's interesting too because I I guess I, I guess like the tongue and the penis and there's just certain things that just don't get chopped off or need transplanting, right? Like I got under like I, I'm trying I like I mean, how often do you hear someone bit off their tongue or had their penis chopped off and they need a new one? So I guess those aren't even um I guess those aren't even uh, in, in high demand. I, I, I guess just based on the economics and capitalism, um, excuse, I am not struggling at all. I'm, th I'm not struggling. What are you talking about? I'm fully enjoying this. I'm struggling because I want to talk about CrossFit, but I'm so fascinated by the transplant thing. Don't ever, don't ever tell me I'm struggling. There's, um, yeah, I, I guess by capitalism and by demand, it's the, or it's the things that are going to be in the highest demand that they're going to transplant the most. Yeah, I mean, a and that's lot of where the times, most experience and success would be or failure. Yeah, I mean, insurance is obviously going to play a big role in that in the sense of like, you know, you can also it's it's the ability to increase that person's quality of life quicker. And so insurance can can help out with that in regard. Um, you know, for instance, like, you know, someone can live on dialysis if their kidneys aren't working. It sucks, but they can do that doesn't work with the liver that way it you can with a heart and a lung but the, the 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 perfusion side of that thing isn't awesome and success rate isn't awesome so it's like it kind of depends um where that is and and where like what what challenges the patient has um when did you get into um uh fitness in your own health and moving did you play sports as a kid yeah yeah i i I played sports as long as I've known. I, I was a really small kid in, in high school, tall and, and gangly. Um, and uh, I played sports all through high school. And then I played relatively competitive football um, for a good bit. 
uh, out of high school while, <clears throat> excuse me, while I was in college. Um, and then after that, um, I kind of had a little bit of a void, you know, and so I started doing a lot of ultra running. So, you know, bigger mountain distance, which I really enjoyed. And then I stumbled into a CrossFit gym in the Bay area of all places, um, in a rock climbing gym. Um, it's, Oh, and Emory, uh, wait, let me, was it in Emeryville or Albany? That one? No. So it was the one, I think the person in Emeryville had started the one it's, so it's with uh, Diablo rock gym. Okay. <clears throat> is that in Oakland so, or where is that? That one <clears throat> is in, um, Concord. Okay. I don't know. And, that one uh, we just walked in there looking, um, just looking at the gym and it was really, really small my wife and I are uh, we met rock climbing. So we're big rock climbers. Um, and I just stumbled out and met who turned out to be a good buddy of mine, Chris. And he's like, Hey, why don't you just try this thing's CrossFit? And it's like, sure. And I showed up the next day and kind of your typical story where I did a Curtis P complex with maybe some burpees and running or something like that. And it just, I, I was really like, I'm like, I'm in the pinnacle of shape and it just crushed me. And then a couple of days later I did Cindy and I was like, whatever, this is gonna be fine. And it wasn't fine. And that was it. That was like, all right, this is what I'm doing for, for the rest of my fitness world. Uh, um, Curtis, 105 pounds for men, 70 pounds for women. Curtis complex is compromised of one power clean, one lunge, each leg and one push press. Wow. I never even heard of that workout. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We were doing the Curtis. So we didn't do the full thing we did. I remember it was like four Curtis piece. So it was the power clean, lunge, lunge, push press. And then it was some burpees and then it was a hundred meter run. And then you came back and did it. And again, I think it was like an 18 minute AMRAP. It was a while ago. You and do the lunge with in the me. front rack. You do the lunge in the front yep. rack. Yeah. 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 That's the hard part. Okay. That lunge gets heavy. Yeah. I bet. Like real heavy. What, what did your wife think when you started that, when you did that? Did she like it? Um. Yeah. I mean, she, my wife is, is, super super just a wonderful human and and anything that puts a smile on my face she's like go get it you know just so it was awesome she um she didn't actually get into crossfit believe it or not until she was postpartum with our first child she went to that crossfit gym and didn't have a great experience because the coaching was pretty terrible um and uh to really fast forward i was training a bunch of clinical staff in my garage just because most, uh, I don't want to generalize, but a lot of people in medicine don't prioritize their health the way they should. And so I just started training a bunch of people in my garage, just six o'clock, a couple mornings a week. And we just started training. And then my wife started training with us postpartum and she really liked it. And then, um, I pulled the trigger and decided to, uh, resign from a full-time position at the hospital and, and open up the gym. And then she really started training and she's a way better athlete than I am. Um, even though she started significantly later in, in her fitness endeavors. Um, but she, she loves she, it now. Uh, you were living in Portland at the time that happened? Mm -hmm. Southern yep. Portland? Interesting. Uh, okay, so you get introduced to cross uh, CrossFit. You didn't have kids. You were at a, a rock climbing gym. And then from there, you just start incorporating it regularly into your training. And But at that time, you're also doing long runs, 50K mm -hmm. runs. And you're training as a runner. And um, – Tell, tell me about how this group started uh, in your garage. You started working out in your garage and then, and, and where were you getting your programming from? Were you getting it from .com or do, programming it yourself? I was programming myself. <clears throat> so I did my L1 uh, shortly after I, um, I started CrossFit in the Bay. I did it in okay. Sacramento. Um, Adrian Bosman was the flow master, I think. And then Katie Hogan um, was, was one of the, the coaches up there. Do you remember the um, year, Dan? Oh, 2000, it's either 2013 or 2014. Okay. Um, and, uh, so I started coaching at that gym in the Bay just briefly. Um, and then we came to, came to Portland when I took that position up at OHSU and I was in the hospital one night. So with, with donation call, you're on call for 24 hours. And if you're on first call, you're going to be in the hospital. And the way that works is we cover every hospital in Oregon, Southwest Washington, and the Boise area. So you have a huge service area. And so you get to know your counterpart because there's a clinical person and then there's a family support person. 
And I was sitting in a hospital in Southern Washington talking to someone um, who was just like, um, you know, my, my fitness and my health has gone to garbage. I'm 36 or 37 years old. I'm not into boot camps and I'm not into this. I'm not into that. I was like, great. Come, come to the garage. And, and I had a very small setup there. I didn't have a gym at that time. And I was like, just come. And then she started kind of talking about what we were doing to the other people on staff. And then we had two and then we had three and then my neighbor came over and then one of the staff's nanny came over and all of a sudden we had five people in the garage and we were training four or five days a week, just doing normal CrossFit stuff. I put them on some progressive overload for some weightlifting because it was all women and they'd never touched a barbell. Um, and we did that for, wow, that's fascinating that it was all like women. a good year. year and a half. Yeah. All women. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, my gym currently is, is more women than men. What is that? What is, there's gotta be a stereotype there or a, um, something there that women are more open to the group class or more open to trying something new or what do you think that is? Is there some sort of like, yeah, I think they're more coachable, more coachable. Okay. Yeah. I think they're more, I think goes back to our first conversation around ego to be completely honest. Like women are like, I don't know how to do this. Great. I'm going to find somebody who shows me how the men were like, I'm not asking for directions. Fuck that. I'm going to wait until, you know, I get super lost and then I'll ask. Right. So I think that's what it is. Women are smarter than us. And, and and your wife sees all this going on in the garage. Yeah, yeah. And she, you know, my my uh, my daughter would come out. She was one at that time or one and a half. And she'd come out and, you know, all the, the ladies loved her. And so it was kind of just this family thing. And, uh, and then it just evolved. So you're doing that. And um, in, the, in the, the, the transplant thing, just – what exactly did you do? So you would be somewhere and someone would be like, okay, we have a heart coming in. And then the, and then you work with the person who knows families who needs heart. So then they call the, the family and then those people come together and then the surgeons come in and they switch out the heart and you're on call 24 so, hours a day. You're, but you're, what are like, specifically, what do you do? Are you the caretaker of the heart in between when it's taken out of one dude and putting another dude? Uh, no. So, Essentially what on my side is we get a call from somebody that's in the hospital that has sustained what is suspected to be a non-survivable neurological injury. Um, And so then we come in and we do a quick medical clinical evaluation based on stability and based on past medical history of that patient. Um, If that's a crazy job determining whether someone's going to be dead or not. Wow. um, And then we, we, so we, to determine whether the organs are going to be viable. And then we take the information the hospital is giving us and like, yes, we'll continue to follow this patient or no, we won't. If the patient progresses, there's two ways you can do organ donation. Um, one is brain death, like clinical legal brain death. Um, and that's when the hospital staff comes in, the attending physician who's completely separate from the or- organ donation process comes in. <clears throat> they do a, a host of tests that show that there's no longer function in the brainstem and it'll never come back. So essentially the blood supply has been cut off from the brainstem and it's no longer viable regardless of what happens. They're clinically um, diagnosed as brain death. There's another one that I'm not going to go into. At that stage, our family team comes in and has a conversation with the family. My job is to keep that patient stable because the brainstem is no longer controlling homeostasis. Mm. So I am playing brainstem without letting the rest of the body know through different, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals or interventions or things of that nature. While we're concurrently, um, analyzing, um, the information we're getting and then providing it to the surgical teams that might be interested as well as facilitating the logistics of, of, do we have an in-house patient or is this patient somewhere else that progresses along? And now we start doing this match algorithm um, where it's like, okay, the kidney's going to go here and the heart's going to go here based on criteria that's separate from our organization or from any <clears throat> procurement org- organization. Um, and then you coordinate the, uh, the surgical teams coming in, set up the operating room. Then we go in, we run the OR essentially. We're the, the, um, the flight path folks. Um, so we're, we're in charge of there. And then once the organ comes out, it's no longer in our hands. Then it goes, the surgical teams take it with them and then they go do the transplant. And so I've done everything from the clinical evaluation, medical management, 
to actually being on the surgical side where I'm assisting, helping the heart come out or assisting with the liver or things of that nature. Um, Hey, your job seems and you're retired from that. Um, currently I am. Yeah. It seems like it would be like, you'd be in high demand. Like there's not a lot of use dance. It, it doesn't, it, it, I could throw a resume out and, and get offers in a week. It, it, I, I, when I applied, so when I applied to uh, OHSU, I submitted my application and I got a phone call in six hours. Um, I guess pulling the, the organ out is really important to the success, right? Like you can't cut any of the tube short, right? Any of the wires short, like you send a heart and you snip something off too short and they're like, dude, you ever yeah. had some crazy shit like that happen? Like that the heart gets there and they're like, dude, you damage the aorta or, or just some shit goes sideways. Yeah. More often than not, it's going to happen with more of an, an abdominal, uh, an abdominal organ um, where, I mean, you know, it's medicine is an imperfect science, right. And it's right. still being done by human hands and, and, and the human body doesn't look like a textbook. Right. So, you know, there, there can be, there can be things like, ah, oh, shit, like I just didn't see that or whatever. That said, the people that are taking these out that are, that are the, the final eyes, the final say, and the ones holding the, holding the cutting device are, are educated to the, to the, to the nines, if you will. So it's a very rare occurrence um, that it happens uh, when you're dealing with thoracic organs. So heart and lung, 95% of the time, the, transplanting team is sending their own recovery team because they want to have hands on. They want to do mm, specific mm, tests mm. within the operating room to make sure that organ is going to be a good fit um, okay. for what, for what they're doing. So there's a lot that goes on behind the curtain that it's just such a, it's such a niche. Um, you know, it's one of those things that nobody, nobody knows about. And then, so, so you have these six people in your gym and then you're um, uh, doing this thing with uh, keeping people, uh, you know, their organs safe until they're harvested. And is that a bad word, harvested, in your business? No, no, oh, that's okay. that's why we uh, procured, okay. harvested. Procu okay, I'll use procured. Uh, harvested seems like like tabloid stuff, like hey, uh, or like horror movie shit. Until uh, they're mm -hmm. procured, and um, and uh, at some point these two across paths to where only one is sustainable or you choose, you choose, Hey, I'm just going to coach full time. Yeah. I mean, another kind of just kind of serendipitous. Um, I had, uh, I had gone down to being more of a contract employee at the hospital just cause we had had a second child on the way. Um, and, and medicine in and of itself, this, the schedules are brutal. <clears throat> and when you're on a triage call like that, it just kicks the crap out of you. You know, you're, you're working 24, 36 hours without sleep in, in this specific area. It's, it can be pretty brutal. And that was just starting to kind of take a toll. Um, and so I went down to contract so I could control my schedule. And then I started working on the education stuff. And I was at a so similar to, to Sousa, where I studied business for about a year before I opened my business. That's when I found. So I found Chris Cooper listening to your podcast at wow. HQ. I was either the first or second one that you did. Wow. And I was, that's when I was considering opening a gym. So I bought his book. I, uh, I can't remember. It's the white one with the green and yellow letters on it. Um, and then I started learning about the fitness business and more so business there. Um, for a year before I even conceived the idea of, um, of opening. So I, I didn't, I just liked CrossFit and I liked fitness and I was always intimidated by business because I'd never learned about it. So I just started learning about it. And that's how I, that's why I went into neuroscience. I didn't know anything about neuroscience. So I was like, yeah, well, I'll learn it here. Um, that's the one right there. Yep. Um, okay. Here comes and, the, tough... uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Nope. Go. Uh, here comes the tough question. Uh oh. Um, did you become uh, numb to death and are children difficult when children come in? Yeah. So when uh, the, you do, we call it, you're kind of dead inside, mm -hmm. um, w am, amongst the, the few people, it is a very hard job to do as a high, high attrition rate. Um, kids are extremely difficult. Um, especially kids that are like in that, 
six to 15 range, like infants, when kids are like, you know, four, five, six and up to 15, they have personalities, they have life, they have, it's just, it's just very, very, very hard. And the families are, are there. And then oftentimes they have siblings and, and those are tough. Um, those are the ones that you, you know, that you remember and you need that this, this type of work needs to have a, a structured debriefing, um, uh, situation or structured debriefing protocol. Cause it, it can be really tough and you, you essentially internalize a lot of things. Um, and you lean on your, your team to help with that. But yeah, kids are real tough. They're real tough. I have this model and understanding of the universe that we're just mirrors here, mirroring each other, that there's this really weird thing going on. And that's why it's so important that we're good examples to each other. And so I'm guessing it's like the first time I saw, I saw a Dracula movie where a guy had to turn into Dracula in order to save his son. And it was probably mm -hmm. a pretty, it was called Dracula untold. And it was probably a really stupid movie, but I had just had a kid, a boy, and he was one year old. And I, I wept through the entire movie because I started p picturing myself as that dad. It was so bizarre. So I'm guessing that's kind of, I'm, I'm guessing that's the hard part, right? Every time you see someone, you, you're, you, if, if you have, if you're empathizing that that's you or that's your kid, I'm, gu I'm guessing that is that the origin of, of the discomfort of the pain? Yeah, I mean that's it's just empathy. It's just like yeah, and that's we're not programmed is... to want to see anything that like you're seeing a kid at the table and you're like that's my son and then from there it's just a spiral. And that's the thing is like the empathy crosses over into sympathy and that's where you can't go. Like you mm -hmm. can't you can't come into sympathy in that regard. Like you cannot put yourself in someone else's shoes. Like you have to be able to say I'm I'm you know I'm very sorry for, for your loss and, and, and whatnot, and be able to separate the emotion. And when your emotion really gets involved, that's when we start to get into the sympathy side of things. And that's what happens with kids. You, um, did you cry a lot at that job? Uh, I don't know as I was a lot, but it's certainly, and I, I remember, I probably could name every single kid case I ever had involved. Oh, in. wow. Yeah, I that's I mean, where having a good memory to, sucks. I, I could forget that shit yeah. quick probably because I have a horrible yeah. memory, but that's tough. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and you you just it's it's just one of those it's it's like glue. Like it just sticks. Um I mean I don't think about it in a negative way, but um it definitely sticks there. Yeah. It, 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 what's bizarre about it too is intellectually it could be explained. There's um the, the it's always it's not like war. Um, it, everything's a net benefit, but it's still just seeing, um, I think yourself part, you know, we're all part of this thing, humanity thing, and somehow we're all connected and, and somehow you're seeing that and, and you're owning it. Right. But it's not like you didn't do it. You didn't hurt the kid. You're what you're doing is helping people, but yet still it's crazy powerful what's happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a it's an experience. It's a, it's a tough thing to, to explain. That's one of the reasons I think the, the, the two positions have such a high attrition rate is like, go ahead and try to do a job interview there and explain actually what's happened, like what's going to happen and what you're going to feel. And like, you know, that's, it's, it's not uncommon to get through, you know, the, the training interval with someone and then have them leave. Um, Cause you just, it's hard to articulate and it's hard to predict how you're going to feel when the first time that you are involved in something like that you have a gym now i do yep and is it an affiliate or is it just a, a gym yep i have an affiliate um we have so we're our our llc name is woods lawn fitness and we have a do business as as crossfit woods lawn woods lawn woods lawn yep it's the name of my uh my 11th generation dairy farm on the west coast on the east coast oh what a trip is that someone's last name no, uh, it's a, it's a name that, you know, forever ago got, got, uh, got picked out by one of my four grandfathers. Oh, so when you say it's the oldest dairy farm, does your, I'm family, not kidding. Yeah, does your family own it? And, yeah. My dad, my dad and my, my mom still operate it with my, uh, with my two brothers. So everybody, 
I have four other siblings and they all live within five miles of the homestead. But two of my siblings live on the homestead in their own, you know, homes that they've built. Um, and so it's 200 and 1784 is when we homesteaded. So however long that is. Um, and so um, it's still operating. It, it probably won't operate much longer as a dairy um, just because small business dairy gets crushed. Um, and it's, it's a hard thing. My father's just a, is a very savvy businessman, self-taught, of course. Um, and, uh, and so that's how they've been able to go for so long. Um, you ever drink milk just right out of the. Oh, as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And is that good? It, yeah. It's warm. It's weird. Um, but um, I imagine it to be fantastic. Like just really mm -hmm. creamy. Hey, when did your family come here, Dan? And where did they come from? Is there well, any shit on the exactly. farm where you can be like, oh my God, my, that's my great grandfather put that scratch on that. My yeah, great, I mean, great grandfather. The, the stone that um, has the 1784 engraved in it is still the stepping stone to walk into the house. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like this square. So that how the white house there, that's still there in full capacity. It's been renovated, but it still looks exactly like that. I mean, exactly. That tree's still there. Like the, it looks exactly like that. The tree up against the house is not, it got hit by a lightning storm 30 years ago, but um, everything's still there. And um, where did they come from? Did they, 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 do you know the story of how your family, where your family came from? They came on a boat, right? I mean, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my family is, is Welsh mostly, um, but I, I'm not sure of the exact pathway. They've been here for so long that we mostly talk about how long they've been here. Crazy. Okay. So, so you have this gym going and in your garage and then, um, and then you're, and you've been doing your job for a long time and you're obviously really good at it and it's in high demand. And then there's, there has to be a decision made, like something creeps into your brain where you're like, Hey, I have to make a decision here. Yep. I'm going to fault Chris Cooper on that as well. Again, I went to a, a summit gathering in Washington and he had a, a representative of two brain there and gave a speech. Uh, it was a great speech. Um, and uh, a guy by the name of Jay, he owns a, a gym in California somewhere. Um, and I had just accepted a full-time education director position at the hospital like a week ago. And I was concurrently going to open up the CrossFit gym. And it was a, you know, mid-level hundred six figures with great benefits and everything. And I, I walked out of the, after Jace spoke, I walked out of the summit. I called up the director and I said, I can't accept this position. I rescind my acceptance. And he was shocked. And to be honest, so was I. I was like, what the hell am I doing? Um, and Did you already have then, your location for your affiliate somewhere already picked out and, and the space yeah, rented? I, I had it all picked out. Yeah. And I was just going to do it part time. And and Jay was talking about stuff. And I talked to a couple other pretty great people there. And uh, I just felt that I needed to, if I was going to give this a go, that I needed to give it a go. Um, yeah. And so I, I rescinded on my, and I called my wife and I was like, this is what I'm thinking. And she's like, just do it. Do you remember, did Jay say something like, Hey, you won't be successful if you go in half ass or was there something specific he said that was like, it's like building, he, building and then pushed it over the edge. Yeah. I mean, he, he tells a story about fear um, and, and overcoming it. And I can't remember the specifics of it. And there was a couple other people that I had talked to one of my first mentors who, uh, used to own a CrossFit gym in Portland. She had always said that she's like, if you won't, if you work at this, this facility halftime, you'll have a halftime business. And I don't do anything halftime. That's just not how I work. And this is just kind of a combination of that. And then, um, I am, I act on feeling I'm not a planner. I, I, uh, that's why I work well in triage medicine as I, I, I act a lot on feeling and I just, it was just a feeling of like, okay, this is, uh, this isn't the right time to do it, but never is. And, and so I knew I needed to make some space and I knew that full-time position wasn't going to allow me to make the space. Isn't it a, a kind of a trippy, there's almost a paradox there. Um, you don't do anything halfway but you also act on feeling. 
because mm-hmm. you would think that the person who doesn't do anything halfway has like, okay, here's the list of pros. Here's the list of cons. Here's the 27 steps. Yeah. Yeah. V- very interesting that you uh, accommodate both of those uh, inside of you uh, as navigational tools. Uh, did you, did you plan your kids? Yeah. Yeah. You did plan your kids. So you knew that you wanted to have kids. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah. It was, uh, and we waited a little bit. We were a little bit, I mean, we weren't, older when we got married but we were in i think i was 30 ish yeah 29 and then we traveled for a while but we knew within a you know four to five year mark of when we got married we wanted to have kids um so yeah absolutely okay they were planned all right okay so um you it, how many clients did you have when you when you oh, hold on sorry one more thing i wanted to ask uh going back to your level one when you took your so you're a really smart guy you've gone to a lot of, you've done a lot of schooling You've also seen um, the the operation that 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 is this farm, this amazing farm, dairy farm. When you take your level one, um, what what was your impression? Did, did it you it was a really great, really great experience. The the one thing, and I wrote I wrote HQ at that time was like the one thing is CrossFit, in, in my understanding at the time was the foundationally was nutrition, like you know off the couch, off the carbs. And the nutrition component was lacking. And so I had a conversation with, with the people that were there um, about like, hey, movement is awesome. This is it. But the nutrition component is, is missing. Outside of that, it was- Was it missing movement. or lacking? Because they do do like- a, You know what? Um, that's, they that's do, a, like, that's an, a they do like an hour on it, right? But you, yeah, what you're yeah. saying is, is like, hey, dude, if it's going to be the foundation, it needs more. Yeah. I mean, when it comes in, if you've got somebody that's metabolically sick, right? They've got- you know, uh, a whole host of comorbidities, whether it be you know, cardiovascular disease or diabetes too, or, or, you know, pick your, pick your metabolic disease. Yeah. We can get them moving, but what's going to get them better quick is fixing their shitty nutrition. And that's going to compounds way faster. Like I've got you for an hour, maybe 90 minutes a day. Um, and you are now out in the real world for 22 hours and you're going to eat multiple times. So if I'm going to educate you, you know, where, where is the best bang for my buck when it comes to, you know, a population like that? And obviously doing it concurrently is fantastic. I remember you had a gentleman on your podcast that talked about putting people on uh, bikes and educating them in nutrition concurrently. This was several years ago. He's a older gentleman from Chicago. Um, Super interesting guy. Um, And that's an interesting thought where it's like, I'm, I'm doubling up where I'm educating people on the impacts of food and how to, to be honest, I think the first thing is just helping people identify what real food is and then helping people identify what a carbohydrate, a, you know, a protein and a fat is, and then what my plate should look like. And just hitting repeat on that. Cause it's like, it seems simple, but then when you look at somebody's plate, when you are at a restaurant or a hospital cafe or, or or whatnot you're like what do you not realize that you know the and and i to be honest i i mean this with with the utmost respect but it's just ignorance people just don't know Completed. what it is yeah, yeah um and so i don't fault people for not knowing now it, a little it, bit worse than ignorance it's ignorance they're willing to defend unfortunately we have a lot of that in society a, right yeah they're, that's it's like point. I'm going to defend my ignorance, but it is ignorance. But they're but they're man, they're willing to defend it at all costs. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that would be the only thing that I and I haven't done an L1. Um, did my L2 after that, and so I haven't done an L1 since. But that would be the only thing that that I would say. Uh, but other than that, it was amazing. It was it was um, just the the small little pieces that we broke everything down into and the flow and the the, the capacity that the, the l1 instructors had to um work to perfect movement and yeah it was just a just a really amazing experience i i wholeheartedly enjoyed that um greg comes on wednesdays i'm gonna press him caleb let's ask greg what happened to the nutrition seminar i mean i have my own story i was there but basically there was a falling out between rob wolf and crossfit and rob was the one who i think who was sort of in charge and spearheading the nutrition seminar and i think it was very successful and very popular and then there was a, a, a budding of heads and then it fell away and it never came back and i know dave and nicole for years wanted to bring it back but it was um it, it never was up to snuff to what Greg wanted it to be. 
but you're it, you're right. It is a complete. It, I was gonna say tragedy. I'll spin it another way. It's a complete um uh oppor There's a huge opportunity. It's a missed there. opportunity. Yeah, yeah. and it's still and it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. All, all yeah. Right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's find out. We'll ask Greg to give us the juicy details of that and where he thinks it should have been fixed and if it needs to be fixed. Yeah. That's that's good. Okay. So you take your level one and then and then um and then you're you're about to start a new job um uh facilitating uh or or more specifically like you were saying maintaining people until that their organs can be um procured procured and also your gym you're at the same point ready to start your gym and when you were thinking about starting your gym did you think of it as a business or as a passion project so that is where i'm fortunate is i thought of it as a business right from the get-go in that my end-all goal was not to be the best coach in the business my end-all goal was to be the best business owner mm -hmm. like i'm not the best coach in my business now i'm not the best programmer i'm not the best nutrition coach i'm not the best operations manager um and so that's that's the goal like i since opening my gym i haven't got a single fitness certification and i've spent well north of sixty thousand dollars in business education over the last six years wow uh, because wow. that's my job okay like my job is to if i want to support the 160 or 170 members as well as the eight coaches in my business my job is to make sure that those doors open up every day and we do so without uh, without a hiccup um and so in the beginning, like all CrossFit gym owners, I was coaching 22, 25 classes a day, mopping the floor, showing up at 4 What year, Dan? What year did it open? 2018. Okay. 2018. Let me see. Tough yeah, year to open. Tough year. Tough year. Oh, and so we were open one year and then COVID hit like, you know, shortly thereafter because we opened in December of 2018. We had the full year of 2019. Um, and then COVID hit when we were on vacation in, in, um, Palm Springs. Um, and uh, we came back and it was like, oh, shit. And then, you know, California got hit hard. Portland got crushed. Yeah, basically, um, you you guys weren't even allowed. You guys had to uh, wear masks. Uh, I, mean, I mean, yeah, you had the most, the craziest rules, the most draconian we had rules, a, right? I mean. In, indoor mask mandate until March of 2022. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> and, but that. But that's, that's that's how I built the out, outside crazy. facility. It it was a challenge, um, oh and we you have to know your environment too, right? Like um, we knew that we weren't going to change the local mandates, and right. I took my my building is not meant for CrossFit. It was a real estate office or something like that. Super low drop ceilings, just garbage. We had to carve them all out, um, but I took it because it had twenty eight parking spots. And oh. parking spaces similar to the bay in Portland are very hard to come by. And did you learn no that through idea. your business? That that's business think. Yeah, parking yeah. spots well, are I more important than parking. ceiling height. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, I'll justify the ceiling height to get twenty eight parking spots, and that paid out, paid dividends because I built a complete outside facility, full pull up bars, squat racks mounted to the to the sidewalks, all matted, the whole thing. So I built. You know, about 1800 square feet of outside with no walls because the way the the mandates were were arbitrarily written and, and very very uh cloudily written you could train outdoors but they didn't give any specification and so we were back at my space six or eight weeks into the first lockdown but we just put people in parking spaces so we put cones across didn't let anybody park in the parking lot we said, you go every other parking space. And we had some big steel carts built that we just wheeled out and everybody took their equipment and they went over to their parking space because we have a, we're visible from a, from a roadway and we How just continue to operate like that. How about the weather? Yeah. So that's why we had it. So we started with a boat tent, a big one, like a, you know, 50 footer and that just got hammered. And then we started, we tried another thing and that didn't work. And then I talked to the landlord. Um, who I started a, a legends program, a 65 plus program. That was the second program I ever started. I started like three weeks into the gym opening. He and his wife joined that program. They're both North of 85. Um, and so I had developed an amazing relationship with a landlord from 
week three of having my business. And he had a builder pretty much on retainer. And we constructed um, the outside facility uh, about you know, 10 months into COVID, the first one, the first facility. And then we just continued to build upon that. So we've got you know 12 foot open ended uh, space there um, with pull up bars there? throughout. Oh, yeah. We use it every day. My members would, they'd quit if I didn't let them work out. Oh, yeah. We work out outside. And it doesn't matter if it's 20 degrees and snowing. That's who we are. That's what we do. Like, yeah, do we, we ever picture dying. that? If you go to my the Woods on Fitness one, you'll scroll through and you'll see. Um, we we hopped on a bunch of affiliate calls in the beginning. Um, uh, Where do people park? In nah. the parking lot. So they I still park. Up, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I took up seven spots, and then we just park on the lawn. Um, we were told in the beginning that we couldn't do it, so we we were on this affiliate gathering. Uh, Randy, who owns. Uh, three, four, six grit out in Gresham's amazing advocate for CrossFit. And he started an affiliate conversation within the Portland area, right? When the lockdowns. And I remember saying, we're just going to work out outside. And, and, and within that group, people were like, you just, you're not going to be able to sustain for the weather. And it was just like, screw it. Like oh, we're going to, that's gonna, nice. Wow. You, there's a way better. There's a bunch of really good pictures in there of like seeing the whole length of it. Yeah. The wall ball targets, everything outside. We just ran a competition there two days ago of an in-house competition. Um, that we always, that we do for, for our members. Is your That's building detached for, is, is it, are you attached to any other businesses? Yeah, we're attached to a, um, a plaid pantry, which is like a Seven Eleven, And then there's two, uh, Verizon and a wireless ho house, some of their servers there. Uh, and then that's attached to a bar. And then we share, uh, alcove with uh, Papa Murphy's pizza. So are, we're in a, we're in a shopping complex. Do they like you? Yeah. Yeah. We have a great relationship. In the beginning, we didn't like my, my building was vacant and it was in a kind of a back parking area. My building was vacant for about two and a half years. There was a lot of drug trafficking, a lot of prostitution, a lot of just shit going on back there. I don't know if you know much about the broken win windows project, but essentially um, we, I just cleaned the parking lot every day and I asked people to leave every day. And we did that ad nauseum. And I just confronted people that were doing things that we didn't want them to do. And so we cleaned up that back parking lot and just the general area just by being nice, but also being like, Hey, this isn't the place to do this anymore. Yeah. The amount of just garbage and broken glass and needles and all sorts of shit that we used to clean up. And it just worked. We were just, we, cause at that stage, the Portland police weren't really allowed to help us. They just wasn't a lot. There's again, I'm not going to go into the Portland politics, but, we just don't have a lot of help. And so you have to be very creative when you need to need to make sure that um, the outside of your business is, is presentable. Um, and so in doing that, um, Oh, there's Ellen. Is that Ellen? Yeah, that's Ellen. She's one of the, she's one of the ICU nurses that we have. She's amazing. God, that um, beautiful structure. Yeah. The, the jerk position sure is. Um, that, that too. Hey, hey, yeah. uh, I, I would just like to say that um, small business is the antithesis of, of Portland government. Small, small <laughs> business is about personal accountability, personal responsibility, um, uh, uh, self-determination, uh, drive, uh, contributing. Obviously, the CrossFit gym is the greatest contributor, small business contributor to any society anywhere in the world. And I've talked about it ad nauseum, but you're bringing people in there. You're making jobs, but everyone who works out there is lower impact on the entire fucking planet. They reduce, they use fewer resources everywhere they go. They eat whole foods that have less packaging. They go to the hospital less. I mean, I could go on and they can help their neighbors more. Um, they're they do do it. They're eminently more capable. I mean, could go on and on. And the fact in in fuck Portland. I know it's not you saying it, but any of these any any politicians who aren't helping small businesses, you're an asshole. I mean, you are just a... anyway. So that that's my um, rant. I know I know that's not your rant, but that's mine. Okay, so 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 you have this thing up and going, and and and, and like in true personal accountability and per true responsibility uh, thing, you, you you're not you you don't you don't do the politics thing like me and play be a whiny little pussy. You're like, okay, I'm gonna take full accountability and responsibility, and I'm gonna start asking people to please step off the property or do your trank across the street. Or, hey, please don't sleep in my entryway. And you slowly clean up. And what you were going to go, I think, is your neighbors really started appreciating and liking you. They saw the value, right? 
the whole complex yeah, got mean, cleaned up because of you guys, the way you carried yourself. Mm -hmm. And it definitely paid dividends too. When I asked the landlord, Hey, can I take up some parking spots and can you help me build this? Right? Like we just did what, my dad and mom would have been proud that we did. We just picked up garbage. We cleaned up. We took it. We took it upon ourselves of like, Hey, this is my space and I don't want garbage on my space. And people just, they, they start to see that they start to see like, okay, this, this is not a place where, um, where we're going to do this anymore. Um, and it took a while. Um, we had to, I have some policies in place where my staff isn't allowed to approach people in cars and, and we have we have some some strategic things in place so that they aren't put in harm's way, um, you know. When 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 we have that, because there's certainly been some instances that are are less than optimal, and, and nothing you'd want your employees to to be around or anyone for that matter. Um, but we have a great relationship with the with the the manager of Papa Murphy's. He's actually fantastic with. Um, some of the the homeless or the transient population that we get in back and forth um, that mostly come to the dumpster because of the plaid pantry and the the Papa Murphy's. There's a lot of food there. Um, but we just have conversations with people, and we we have a couple of folks that have some pretty significant um, challenges uh, that sleep. And essentially, we had a conversation like, "Hey, <clears throat> if you're going to sleep here, can you sleep over here? Still stay under this place, but I can't have you sleep next to my squat rack, and I can't have you cover up my door." And you can't be lighting fires from 5 a.m. <laughs> till. I, I mean, right. It, uh, no one know, wants it, to work it, out next to a bonfire. So we, and we have that relationship with a couple and, and, yeah. and we just know, I tell my coaches like this, this guy's name's Dion. Just make sure you say hi to him Yeah. and just talk to him. That's yeah, it. He, he just won't, let him be seen. Yeah. Ignore. Treat him like That's a human. It. Let him be seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. And, and, and so I think, I'm not going to go into the Portland politics, but like, but that, Hey, but Hey, you know what? I appreciate, thing. I appreciate that. That's a realistic look at the situation. Um, I, uh, they are at the end of the day, they're people and they, and people want to be seen. I've seen most of the people who support homeless people and they, with their tax dollars, they've are completely disgusted by them and won't make eye contact or talk to them. I'm like, what are you doing? They're just people. Like when someone yeah. asks you for a dollar, you look up in the eye and you say, hi, not today. You don't fucking like, yeah, it's just people. Yeah, I mean it's it's a conversation, right? And yeah. sometimes those conversations are uncomfortable, and people don't like to be uncomfortable. Um, and so that that's just has worked well for us. Sometimes it doesn't work well and goes sideways, and right. we're like, oh, shit, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but for the most part, uh, we don't we don't run into challenges anymore, and, and that has really helped with our relationship um, with with everybody else in the that shares the shopping complex. Um, the, and the facility looks beautiful. Okay. So you open this thing in 2018, you get through, uh, the first year, which is, you know, probably never easy for a business. And then, uh, COVID happens and you get through that. And, um, the, oh, I want to go back to one other thing that uh, mm -hmm. very subtle nuance. You said, you said uh, one of the strongest correlates for people's lives going sideways is not having a mom or dad. Whether it's being mm -hmm. uh, obese, getting into crime, getting cancer, it's crazy how strong the correlate is for all of those things. Not cause and effect, but correlate. And something you said is, I, tr I treated these people the way my mom – I did what my mom and dad would have done. You said that. Yeah, yeah. Like, And isn't that interesting? Building. You had a mom and dad at home, and even as a grown-ass man who's got a beautiful wife and two kids and a business and is smart, you still reference what your mom and dad taught you. I mean – the reason that we were successful during COVID and, and, and this isn't a, a boast or anything, we didn't accept any money from, we didn't apply for any government funding or anything of that because of my background. My, my, if you're, you are a gritty human, if you're in the dairy industry, like you have to be. And I pride myself on that. And those are the, the things that I learned you know, from my dad and my mom, my mom was a prison guard for a long time. Um, and my, yeah. my dad, you know, was a dairy farmer for a long time. And so, um, doing hard things, um, and just, you can't do hard things one time. You've got to do it consistently. And that's the, the epitome of being a small business owner is like, walking through shit and continuing to walk, wipe your shoe off and keep walking and know you're going to step in shit again, but maybe you'll see it this time and you can walk around it, but there's always going to be shit in your way. 
I'm, I'm, guessing as a, I'm guessing as a dairy farmer in Massachusetts, six months of the year, the job sucks because it's freezing. And then the, as soon as the cold goes away, you, six months of the year, you're covered in flies. And so you, yeah, and there's, <laughs> there's, and it's just hard the whole time. It's either it, it goes from it's ice hard. to mud to flies to too hot to back to ice. And it's just like, Jesus, can I just get a week in here? Yeah, it's uh, my dad used to say, uh, the work within dairy farming isn't hard. It just never stops. Right. Um, so. the, uh, uh, in, in the, in the big story here that, um, we're an hour and 10 in, and I haven't even touched it is what you said. So the, I've never heard this before. Everyone is chasing. Everyone's always proud of all their certifications. And you, granted you are a hard worker. You have, you had a lifelong of, of, uh, of fitness and physical movement. So you had a, a tremendous foundation for that, but you've invested all of your extra time in making sure how to run a business. What does that mean? Like how to do the books or how to treat customers or what is it? What, what's the scope of this $60,000 investment in, in education yeah. you've given yourself? Um, I mean, it's, it's all of that. It's um, learning systems and operations, learning how, so I, I won't step foot in my gym um, until probably next Tuesday. Um, and so my staff needs to know how to turn on the lights and they need to know how to run classes and they need to know how to sign someone up. They, cause we do a prescriptive consultative process. Um, they need to know what happens in session six in our on-ramp. They need to know what happens or when the programming's done, they need to know how the nutrition conversation happens, whether you're a current nutrition, um, client or you're a prospective one, they need to know how the gym is clean. They need to know how to set up the outside speaker system, where the chalk is, when the chalk runs out, like literally everything that you take for granted when you're the business owner, people don't know how to do it. And so building that, you know, those systems and processes, and then, you know, going further of like, okay, this is what a job description looks like before I post a job description. Oftentimes you see people like, Hey, I need a CrossFit coach. I'm like, great. What's their job? What is your expectation? Because you can take my job description, but that's for my gym, not for yours. Like your ethos, your demographic, your goals within your business is different. And then What's your onboarding process look like? That's all got to be documented. That's all got to be developed. Like you don't just get it. Like I love it that CrossFit's not a franchise. If they ever CrossFitted or if they ever they ever franchise, I'd be gone. Um, I love it that CrossFit leaves me alone the business wise because then I can run it specific to what I want to do. Probably goes back to my you know background of like liking to do this kind of stuff. But the the challenge with that is you don't have any of the resources of how to run a business. And so you have to build all of those from the ground up. Um, I was fortunate enough to, like I said, I've listened to your podcast. So thank you very much. You're actually the reason that I'm on this podcast is because of a podcast that I listened to you host and then introducing uh, me to Chris Cooper that way and then learning about him, educating and realizing like, okay, if this thing's going to be a real thing, then I need to make sure that my employees show up and they can do what they want to do. Um, and then it just becomes multi-level. Like you hire your first CrossFit coach and that's a very different job description than I have for my manager of operations or my head coach or my director of training or my nutrition coach. And so evolution of there. And we haven't even talked about books, right? Like I learned my books and then I hired a bookkeeper once we got to a certain level. Cause it's like, that's not my area of genius. And again, my job isn't to be the best bookkeeper now. It was in the beginning, similar to accounting. My second year, I hired an accountant where I was like, this is no longer my area of expertise. So I'm going to hire someone in for that. So there's all that. And then there's program creation, right? Like my, my program's diversified. So we do a lot of private training. We do a lot of hybrid training, a lot of semi-private training concurrent with our, with our group classes. And we, we have very small spaces. So logistics are a challenge there. Documenting figuring out the flow of that and then educating all of our staff for that. So again, I can be here, like we're going to put probably a hundred people through my gym today. That's a usable space inside. We have under 2000 square feet with all of my coaches working today. And I won't, I won't do anything because my operations director knows how 
everything needs to be done. And all my coaches have been educated, like, this is your role here. This is how you do. That takes a long time to do. And it takes focus on those processes, then building it into a system. So now you have operations. So today, Um, if I come in with my wife and my three kids and I'm like, hey, I want to join up this CrossFit gym. Do you have a family plan? There's someone who can answer my question. If your mm -hmm. toilet backs up, there's someone there who knows exactly which plumber so they won't be like hey uh they won't be like hey dan's not here um uh come back next week they'll they'll actually they know what to say to me or if the toilet backs up they won't be they won't put a sign on the door saying the toilet's not working they'll call the plumber and get it fixed like you're saying like you have that thing if there's a homeless guy on the porch there's someone there who knows how to talk to him and be like oh dion what's up dan said you normally yeah. don't come till 8 30 at night do you mind giving us a few more hours until we shut the doors yeah, yeah. Shit so, like that. I mean, you're saying that all that's you're you have that shit just dialed. Yeah, everybody knows in everybody knows that there's a new person that comes in that they come through a consolidated process. We call it a no sweat intro. Every single member knows that. Sam, he's one of my coaches. He's also our facilities manager. He does all that stuff. So he'd get a text message like, "Hey, the second bathroom is clogged, or the rower number six isn't working, or the assault bike needs to be tightened, or whatever." Um, And that's all facilitated through um, the operations manager um, unless a new person comes in and then all the coaches know like, Hey, let me, let me schedule you uh, for a no sweat intro with Jonathan uh, or Brandon. Um, Those are the two coaches that do our no sweat intros currently or myself when I get back. Um, I bet employees are happy because everyone knows their role and their boundaries and the rules. And then from there inside of there, they're kind they're free. It's like raising kids. It sounds like I bet you, do you have happy employees? Yeah, I, I like to I, I like to empower them. We run an entrepreneurial model where nobody can come work for me that doesn't want to build something within my business. Mm, wow. um, you know, like my my head coach and my and, and my uh, director of training, we built a physical therapy clinic within my within my space for him because he's a he's a has a doctorate in physical therapy, and we have since sold him that practice. Um, and so now he practices there, but he still coaches as a CrossFit coach and does private training as a CrossFit coach because he loves CrossFit and he integrates that within that practice. My nutrition coach, um, I hired her with the interest of taking over our nutrition program. My operations guy, we hired him with the interest of taking over operations. We have another guy, Brandon, who who does a lot of our teens athletes. Um, and so everybody has a focus within. There's no like garden variety thing they do. So they all have their own little thing that they're, that they're, that they're able to build upon, um, which is what I think really empowers people. And it takes a lot of the stress off because they don't have to worry about the, the lease payment, right? I think about my lease in the five year span, not the month to month. You know, it's like, well, I just signed a $400,000 lease that I got to pay for over the next four years. Right. Or I've got to, do this. They don't have to think about that. They don't have to think about insurance. They don't have to think about a barbell. They don't have to think about all those things. They get to just think about what they want to do. Mm. And we try to empower them that way. Um, what about class size? Do you have a limit on your class size there? We do. Yep. So for our CrossFit classes there, it's 12 during the weekdays. And then we do 16 on the weekend uh, for Saturday and Sunday. Cause we do partner workouts on the weekend, but we control our logistics. A we controlled it in the beginning uh, because we <clears throat> wanted to have the highest level of coaching possible. And that comes somewhat from my, my background of, of wanting to excel there, but also from understanding um, how the business model needed to work. Cause I'm in a really expensive County. Multnomah County is very expensive. My lease and everything there is extremely expensive with a small space. If we don't have a high revenue per member, then we're not going to make it. That's just the way it goes. And so you've got to figure out how can I provide that value? And one of the ways is controlling your logistics. So oftentimes, for instance, if we're doing power cleans or we're doing deadlifts or squats or whatever it might be in a strength component, we're going to pair people up. So there's fewer people moving at a time so we can provide more coaching to them. Um, and so is that a problem? We, how, how, what if uh, I get there and there's already 12 people there? Do they, Do I sign up in advance? Yeah. So we have a 24 hour, um, you're allowed to sign up 24 hours in advance and then you can unregister an hour beforehand. We have a wait list. Um, it depends on which class I do give the coaches discretion. 
for the most part, if we have someone show up, it's going to be a parent that's like, this is the only time I can get in and we make an exception for it. We're not hard and fast. Um, like, Oh, nope, there's only 12. You got to go. Yeah. Um, some coaches have the ability like myself and then, and then a couple of our very experienced coaches, they can run a class of up to 16 without a problem. Some of our newer coaches might not. And so we give them discretion of like, Hey, if you can control this load, then you can let some of the wait list people in. If you don't feel comfortable, then stay with the 12. I, I apologize. One of the listeners is posturing on you. Uh, I'm such a good coach. I can run a 70 person class and be present for each of them. I, I, we know Mason. Yes, dude, that's awesome. Send me your <laughs> resume. If it has certifications, I don't want to look at it. Oh, uh, that's good stuff. I, he's really being humble. It, really, it's it's over a hundred. I've seen him work. Right? It's, yeah. yeah, it's, it's That's awesome. It's absolutely uh, remarkable. No, he's not being silly. On this is this is a show of facts. <laughs> uh, is the gym maxed out? Is the gym maxed out then? Like, have you capped memberships? We always teeter with that. Uh, I mean, technically, we could. We actually just recently added a 5 a.m. class because we were getting massive wait lists for our 6 a.m. class. And that's helped out a little bit. We do, when we have new people come in for their no sweat intro, we do have a conversation with them around like, hey, if you're targeting our 6 a.m. class or our noontime class, um, it could be a little bit tight. Um, and so let's see if we can find another one for you to be consistent at. Um, we... We have a couple of different programs that allow us to have more athletes in than the 12 person class would allow for. And so by diversifying with our hybrid training and our semi-private training, um, we can get a lot of athletes in like 6 a.m. on a Monday, we're running a six person semi-private, a four on one hybrid training, and then a cap 12 person class. Um, and so oh, but those are 20, four different classes still though. None of, none three of those different ones. Yep. Oh, three yep. different ones, but still none of those are over 12 or 16. No, nope, no, but we've got 22 people in the building. Okay. 22 athletes in the building with three separate coaches. What's Again, back to the operations and system. I'm what's sorry. A, so, sorry. I, I got, uh, what's a six person semi, uh, private class. What's that? So that's the one that I'm, that I'm kind of known for. So we do a, uh, eight week um, six on one semi-private strength training block. And so what we found out about two and a half years ago was people wanted a little bit more specification for the areas that they're at. Oftentimes is it was around strength training specifically. Um, and I just couldn't find any good private training coaches. I had two really good ones and we, I was turning away clients, turning away private cl training clients. And so we built out this six on one semi-private strength training block where we do two sessions a week. It's at the same exact time. So it's structured like the class, but it runs for eight weeks. So they do 16 um, sessions. It's always the same six people. It's always the same focus within that eight week block. And it's always the same coach unless a coach is on vacation. Um, and so those got really popular. I mean, we'll, we're running between eight to 12 of them um, per like at a time, eight to 12 different blocks. Um, and so um, those are really powerful for our athletes being able to a get a little bit cheaper of a private training session because it's in a smaller group, but it's still specified um, for them. Are they and members of the me... gym though that also do the oh, other yeah. classes? So they do the other classes yeah. too. That's yeah, forty-eight about... to seven. That's forty-eight to seventy-two people at all times are in those classes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And how yeah. often do those classes meet? So they meet uh, two days a week um, are the blocks. And so we'll run like, I think. And what now would I learn? Got... Like I would learn like the Olympic lifts. It'd be like, okay guys, this is eight weeks on. No, no, no. We mostly do com. So more of it, deadlift, back squat, front squat, pull up a lot of midline development movements that are tough to do in classes. So hip thrust blocks, hip thrusts are fantastic for low back pain. They're also great for glute development, which, so it's a double What's whammy for most people. You, like your back's on a block and your feet are out there and then you, you, you look like you're humping the air. Is that a hit? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Pretty much. Okay. Um, and we do a lot of strong person. So sandbag carries and, and a lot of strong person midline stuff. People really like them. Um, because it it's a focus training for eight weeks. It's in a much smaller environment. Um, and they, they do get results a little bit faster 
because they're going to focus on that exact thing for eight weeks. Most of those people are doing two to three CrossFit classes, or they're doing some private or hybrid training as well. So we have very few of the people that are in our semi-private program um, that are only training twice a week. Most everybody else is training um, four times a week plus. Um, did you ever do the, you, you said you read the book from Chris Cooper. Did you ever do the mentor program? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a mentor. I work for Chris Cooper. Oh, you do also. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you went through his program and then afterwards you're like, I'll also be a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been in the How do you have time for that. My God. Systems and processes. Yeah. Like, I, I don't mean to be like, like that's, that's where most gym owners cap out is they don't, they, they go after their, their certifications as a coach, which if that's what you want to do, like if you want to be a guy, I had a conversation with a business owner the other day. I'm like, do you want to be a coach or do you want to be a, do you want to be a business owner? Mm. Cause you can be both, but there has to be this. Right. And it's like, if you want to have employees, the business owner has to go up. You have to be the business owner. Um, and so I've been in the Tinker program, which is the, the highest level two brain program. Uh, this is my second year in that. And then last year I invested in my education to get into, well, I you first have to get accepted into the mentorship program. And I did that last year. And so uh, right now I mentor 12 or 13 gym owners. You know, I've got a couple uh, that are local and then I've got a couple in Sydney, Australia, like everywhere in between. So, um, so you're a mentor, but you're also in the program learning more stuff. Yeah, that's right. That's in, I'm headed to Vegas on Wednesday to meet up with all my Tinker buddies um, and learn from them. Oh, and you guys sit around and share it. So like um, your um, six person class you were just talking about, you'll share that with the group. Be like, God, guys, this is really popular. This really works. This is how you manage the space for them. This is how you introduce it. Like you'll share the, 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 in the process and system and places for that program, for example. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've done a ton of specialty calls for that over the last six months. And then I, I, I've been talking about it. I've run been running it for two and a half years. So I've been talking about it in the Tinker Group for two and a half years. Um, and What's then, the weirdest um, thing you've heard in the Tinker program? Was anyone been like, hey, dude, I started selling bottle caps to people and they're buying them. It's weird. Um, like, you is know, there anything like it, crazy thing or like, hey, we have a bring your own roll of paper towels day. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, is there anything like. I don't know if there's anything like weird. They're just. It, they're so fascinating and they're so successful. Like those, those the, people, the, the, the ideas just, that people bring yep. there. Oh, they're not even mm -hmm. ideas. They're things that they're ideas that are now in, in place. Yeah. Like everybody, uh, you know what? It, it's really cool that you have an idea, but if, if you can't act on it, then it's right. just an idea. Right? right. And I think that that's what people get mired in. And that's why as you get closer to the tip of the spear, it gets more narrow. Um, and these people are, are just, unbelievable um the things that they've accomplished both within the fitness industry and then as they 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 create generational wealth for their families outside of the fitness industry whether it be you know real estate investment or it be stock investment or they invest in becoming a mentor and helping other gyms or they they help purchase other gyms or they purchase other gyms or they purchase other businesses or, or whatever they do like they when you get into the tinker program you evolve like into a a really solid business person. Um, and it's, it's just, I love, I love these meetups. They're, they're so awesome. How do you, did you have, do you have to graduate from something else before you get to the tinkers that you do? Yeah. So you start in ramp up, which is essentially building foundational uh, awareness of how to kind of run your business specifically through the two brain model. And that, that has recently changed a little bit. And it, it, it has some specific things that we coach people through. Uh, and then you go into the growth phase where we're focusing on something specific within your business and, and through the, the pathways that Cooper has, has outlined for us. Um, and then dumping gasoline on that so that we can accelerate the growth in like, you know, the, the length of time people stay with you or the average revenue that you generate per member or your client load, like how many clients you have or how much money you're taking home or, you know, just, just multiple areas that we focus on and then you get to a level at which you're you're more comfortable and you can step away from the business and it doesn't break down and then you have the choice to to ascend 
to tinker. And then that's another interview process where you talk to, you talk to either Chris or, or my former mentor, Jolene. Um, um, and, uh, and they, they say, yeah, you're a good fit for tinker. You know, this is what it is, or maybe you're not a good fit for tinker. Um, if I'm a gym owner and I'm listening to this podcast right now and I'm like, Oh man, I've been sitting on the fence about this Chris Cooper thing. I'm going to sign up, but I want Dan. Can someone request you? Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a mentee call today with a guy that listened to, to a, I did a podcast with, uh, with John Franklin, who's the CMO of two brain, uh, two months ago, three months ago in Dallas. And he listened to it and he had a gym in Sherwood, which is just South of us. So I went and met him for coffee because he DM me and wanted to know about my semi-private program. And I went down and had a conversation with him and I was like, you know, no, no way um, trying to promote anything. And then finally he asked like, tell me a little bit more about two brain. And so then I told him, um, and then it, uh, a week later, I got an email that he now uh, is a mentee of mine and I get to see him on, on zoom today and help him grow his business. Wait, the guy who's in charge of the two brain podcast interviewed you and then chose you to be his mentee. No, no. A guy listening to the, a guy Oh, listening listen to, to it. The, okay. Um, because yep. I think, uh, but you got to max out somewhere, right? You can't take everyone. Like, I think I, I hate to, uh, I think you're going to get bugged now after this, doing this podcast by a handful of people. What's the maximum people you can take? Are you almost full? I am not. No. Uh, so, well, I and I know they have other my... capable people there, but man, you're really yeah. coming across really like, you know, like, like you're doing, <laughs> like, you know, your shit. I mean, the men the mentors at two brain are just dynamite. Like any one of them you get matched up with is, it's just going to help you so much. Um, we, so we have a, we have a soft limit and then we kind of have a hard cap. Um, for me right now, um, I have kind of a soft limit of how many I'll take. Um, and it'll be specific to where kind of the phases are. Um, is it and so again, at all? would you take, would you take someone like in, in Copenhagen? I mean, I have a client in Sydney. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter because that's the great thing about Zoom, right? It's kind of a pain to schedule in the beginning. But I was just um, culturally fit. I mean, I mean, but I mean, shit. If you can succeed in Portland, man, you could succeed. If you can run a small business in Portland, you can run a small business anywhere. It's a uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we get to we get to go around and 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 meet with people. And so I mean, I I had several calls with people following those podcasts, just kind of explaining how my process works, and and I'm. That's the cool thing when you get when you ascend ascend to the level um, that some of the gym owners are that are in this tinker program. Probably within any, I would hope within any field, um, you're you're just looking to help people. So like if people DM me, I I get right back to them. I, if they want to set up a chat or if they want to have coffee or they want whatever, like I'll tell you what not to do. I can't. I mean, I've made the mistakes, you know, and and I want. If someone if someone wants advice and I can be of of a helping hand, um, I got nothing to hide. And so, um, yeah, I just try to help people when you get to this level. That said, you do have to set a cap, and so I have a cap there. But back to the systems and operations with my operation manager in place, um, the day to day at the gym, I don't get mired as much, and I do all the the marketing and the social media stuff. We do organic and affinity marketing. We don't do any paid marketing which I really enjoy doing that. And I do the goal reviews with all of our clients um, as well as the no sweat intros. We, my operations guy and I split those. He does a few more than I do, uh, but that op opens it up the opportunity to do some more consulting. Why do you stay affiliated, Dan? <clears throat> That's a great question. I mean, it's something that we go back and forth with. I truly believe in the methodology of CrossFit and certainly they have ebbed and flowed especially a lot in the last five to six years, you know, in multiple areas uh, that if you aren't mature makes it really difficult to, uh, to get in line with. But at the end of the day, um, by mature, you mean mature, like, uh, intellectually or mature as a business, if you're not already a mature business or both, probably both. Okay. Um, just recognizing that like, they can, they can say a whole lot of X, Y, and Z, but we're, we're still not, we're not franchised. So I can still operate my business. However, I heard Craig Howard talking about that on one of your podcasts a while ago of like, I still get to run my business the way I want to run my business. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and 
and again, it, it may be a little bit unfair that I treated my business like a business so that I, I like that where some other affiliate owners might be like, oh, I wish they would give me more guidance. I prefer not to have it. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The barrier of entry is very small um, as far as like, well, this is what I have to do to have an affiliate. Uh, they are long overdue for a rate increase. I know that it stinks for a lot of business owners and affiliates that are that are, have razor thin margins, which is the majority of affiliates. Um, and I, I, I get that, like that, that's a huge margin for me. I just continue to promote what CrossFit does bring the media department back in and tell some stories like that, that talk to the general population. That is the number one thing I have to do in no sweat intros is tell people like, we're not Instagram CrossFit. You're not going to get hurt here. Like, this is what you need to become a formidable human and to pick your grandkids up or to be able to walk upstairs or to keep as much skeletal muscle mass on. And so just continuing to like, to, to solidify the brand and the integrity around it, um, that it doesn't hurt people. Um, and so the other one is, is I think that the certification process is very good. Now I listened to Susan's podcast the other day. Similarly, we don't let people just get their L1 and then come in and coach. We have a complete process outlined of, of how you're going to be onboarded as a coach. And then we do a structured coaches development every single month, third Thursday for an hour. So continuing education in house with our coaches. Um, but I do think the certification is nice to have that in an area that I trust. Um, and so that's, that's why I keep it as I, I believe in it. Oh, okay. So, uh, Jake Chapman, uh, uh, kind of unfucked me a little bit here. He said, ask the question again, um, change the question to what value does being an affiliate give you? Are, are you doing a brand loyalty payment? Is that what you're doing? Are you, are you doing a tithing? Are you doing a, um, a, a church payment? It, which listen, I, I, and I, and I'm not, I'm not saying that with any judgment. I'm, um, <laughs> uh, as, as right before Greg sold the, um, Jim, he started telling me, he's like, Hey, cat's out of the bag, dude. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, we got like, we got like, all we can do now is uh, litigate, educate and legislate. Like we like, cause now it's all brand loyalty payments. No one's paying us for mm -hmm. shit. Like we got to like, we got to fight for the affiliates on fronts that they can't see. Um, he's not wrong. Yeah. So, um, um and, and I know, I, I know, and he did some pretty fucking remarkable shit to stop licensure, mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, although it feels like it could be creeping back in. Um, do, do you do 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 people really not know why they pay you think maybe i mean i, um, I can't get a straight answer from Sousa, but he's more than happy to pay it and he's yeah, a smart, i mean he's a smart fucking guy he's one of the smartest guys i know i is it emotional no it's it's no it's, it's no. not emotional i have a lot of hope for for what crossfit could do within the medical community so i one of the biggest reasons i opened the gym is i knew that i could help more people in a crossfit gym that i was helping with in the, the donation world okay absolutely could make a much bigger and and i have some hope there um there's well, a lot it's of work ha it's happening yeah it's happening i guess my question to you is okay let me just be uh, even uh let me try again um if, if you stop being affiliated would you lose clients no no okay all right nope. fair enough um yeah fair enough cool yeah Hey, uh, you're, you're awesome. What, a, what, a, what a cool dude you are. What a, what a man, your kids are stoked. Your wife is stoked. You're stoked. I, I'm what a great, uh, what a great pleasure to meet you. I'm glad our paths uh, crossed. You're so, um, you're, you're killing it in your corner of the world. And, uh, it, it, it you're going to add tremendous value. This podcast can add tremendous value, um, to, a lot of gym owners who listen to it and you give a, a lot of hope. And I think you're going to change the trajectory for a lot of people who it's kind of, you, you change my opinion a little bit because I always see it as being a, a kind of as much as I love Chris Cooper and not a, a dirty thing to say, I want to run this gym like a business. I've always had a little bit of a bad taste. Like, Hey, um, maybe that's just the liberal in me, but, um, like it's a bad, it's a bad thing to su to succeed and run it like a business. But you really have, uh, you may have just thrown the straw that broke the camel's back on there for me. I really appreciate you, dude.
Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're trying to do, trying to do good things. Yeah. You're obviously, you're trying to run a business so that you can keep people in there to keep getting fit. And, uh, and you've definitely seen both sides of the world. You've seen the medical world and what can go wrong there. No one, no one should want an organ transplant, right? So if you can mitigate that, if you, nope. can, <laughs> yeah. if you can mitigate that by, uh, visiting a uh, woods long CrossFit, do it. Uh, right. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much for the opportunity. It was great to chat with you. Yeah. Awesome. All right, dude. Uh, have a great day. You too. Bye. Ciao. Damn. Whoa. His kids are lucky. They're not going hungry. That guy's capable of, that guy's just capable. Stealing My kids grow up to be. What'd you say? Sit stealing food from homeless people. <laughs> he, that guy's eminently capable. For sure. Um, uh, what uh, Graciano Rubio? If you're not affiliated, you're the last in line to get a response from an affiliate owner. I don't understand. But if you are affiliated and need help or advice, or other affiliate owners will help you out far beyond what you probably deserve. Oh, meaning if you pay your affiliate fees, it's not what you get from HQ. It's what you get from the other gyms that pay the money. Is that what you're saying? We're gonna help family first. That's interesting. We're all dumb. We pay four to five hundred a year, so we like other dumb people. No, I'm not just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> Damn. I'm joking. I'm Damn. Joking. Yes, yes. <laughs> we ain't helping any of you other suckers out there. If you don't pay four or five hundred dollars, and fuck you. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good dude. He's pretty, uh, there's this uh, word, uh, equanimous, equanimity, equanimous. Is that the word? Equanimous. Is that a word? Calm and composed. Oh, yeah, yeah. That guy's calm and composed. Yeah. Equanimity. Uh, mental calmness, composure, and evenness temper, especially in difficult situations. Well, when you harvest organs for a living. Is Sevi part of an affiliate? Yeah, I'm my own affiliate program. I'm part of the Matuthian family. Hey, what's up, D'Souza? D'Souza. What's up, Myron? Hey, Myron. Is it Myron? Myron. Probably Myron. No, if he was is he a black guy? If he's a black guy, it's Myron. <laughs> I don't think he's a black guy. Yeah. You never know these days. It's true. He could identify as black. Say Vaughn. Say Vaughn. I swear my teeth are, teeth are whiter. Of course they are. Of course they are. God, that guy's an organ harvester. Well, well, he he's he was in the uh, in the organ factory. Yeah, right. It's crazy. <laughs> my brother-in-law used to do that. In China? Yeah. No, here. In China, they get organs out 10, 10 times faster than uh, than Dan did. Yeah. Dan did oh, for sure. They might hey. have some mix in them, but, you know, they'll still work for a little while. Oh, look at look at this. Uh, here's a lesson in relativity. Chris, uh, Chris Biesterfeld, uh, my teeth are getting whiter or I'm getting tanner. See the relativity there? Was I around during the Black Box Summit? I saw someone ask that. God, you guys don't know your shit at all. I went to go look at it, go read it real quick. What the Black the, Box Summit was? Yeah, because there's that article about it that he, what's his guy, what's his face wrote? Rob Wolf. Yeah, and uh, the website like gave me a 404 error. Like it didn't want me to read it. It's so, uh, so basically for those of you who don't know, and I'll tell like the most generic version I can. But basically there was this meeting of box owners and James Fitzgerald was there. And um, uh, who is the guy? Uh, what's China Cho's husband's name? Freddie Camacho was there and uh, Greg Everett was there. A bunch of people were there, o o like old time CrossFitters. And um, and I think Greg Everett put up a picture of uh, Annie Sakamoto doing a med ball clean. And she <laughs> said he said. uh this isn't how you do a med ball clean. And I think Dave stood up and goes, said something to him like, Hey, why don't you shut up? You fat fuck. 
<laughs> just in the middle of this. And though, hey, but dude, I mean, like, he, he this is a, uh, a seal. I mean, he went on uh, two deployments after that. He was home from a deployment. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, um, um, in, in a nutshell, I'm, I'm really oversimplifying it, but in a nutshell, it was like whether what she was doing was a clean or not, like, hey, use a different picture, right? Don't use one like, like you know, Greg, you're a CrossFitter. We're all CrossFitters. Why are you using Annie as the example or just something? It was something like that. And then that just broke, that just got weird, right? And there was a time when like everyone, everyone kind of wanted to be the know-it-all, but like. CrossFit was still like making the land grab after lunch. Oh, when this photo came out, Greg said, I'm not going to get into this right now. Dave yelled out. No, get into it. Greg thought this was Michael Rutherford and said, not now, sweetie. Oh, either way, Dave thought he was being disrespectful and yelled out in the middle of the lecture, uh, uh, attended by over 70 people from around the world at the event that was not HQ sponsored event. Fuck you, fat fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Greg Everett's not even fat, but anyway, I think it's cool. I don't know Greg Everett. I've only heard good things about him. Um, I fucking love Dave to death. What can I say? Uh, so good. But dude, this is, yeah, I mean, this is fucking, that was, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but four days earlier, Dave may have put a fucking bullet in someone's pumpkin. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like I, yeah. uh, there's a no chance he did it. than he didn't. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, um, um, yeah. So I mean, it, it's like Chris teeth, Chris's teeth. Like maybe they're not getting whiter from a tooth. And he's just getting tanner. It's all relativity and context. And I honestly, I don't know. I don't know this for a fact, but I don't think Greg was like butt hurt. I think he just said, like, said he he kept on with the lecture unfazed. He, yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think Greg was. Um, it's just it's kind of like the thing between um, Dave and Rich too. Like people have way thicker skin. Like people have people have. I have really thick skin. People have way thicker skin than 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 the average people out there. Like so. Big boys, boys, men. Oh, please. My dentist told me to throw out the tooth powder. He said it was scratching my already perfect enamel. Yeah, you should do that. You should li You should listen to him. My tooth theme was too abrasive. Yeah, you should listen to him. For sure. 100%. The guy who's, the guy who's been putting fluoride in kids' mouths. Hey, um, in all seriousness, Braylon, you should look up uh, what over fluorided teeth look like when they get too much, uh, and, and then you'll start seeing a lot of people have over fluorided teeth. It's those those white squiggly lines that people get in their teeth. It's just the enamels all fucked up. Yeah, you should trust them. My dentist was also anti-vax and fluoride. Oh, all right. So I trust him. All right. All right. He doesn't use fluoride. All right. Fine, fine, fine. Uh, seven of my girls, my girlfriend's teeth, uh, are f my seven of my girlfriend's teeth are feel so polished. I can't tell from French. Oh, I can tell from French kissing. Yeah. Uh, Rambler is Rob Wolf the paleo guy? Yes, he was. Oh, or uh, dildo, or just brush your teeth as God intended with cock. Interesting. Oh. I think that's it. Let me see what's going on. Oh, tomorrow is a uh, Matt Souza show. Oh, uh, David will come out with a um, we can review. We can review. Is he going to review being on your show, so that we can review him reviewing him being on your show? Maybe. That'd be cool. Uh, 
Then Greg comes on Wednesday. We'll ask him about the uh, nutrition seminar. Oh, that'd be great. And then on Thursday, another affiliate series. Damn, we're ramping up the affiliate series. And then Friday, John Singleton. I think John Singleton was, was he coaching that group that was on the island of Majorca? And he doesn't anymore, right? Uh, um, Laura Horvat's, uh, Christoph Horvat's girlfriend. She Gabby was on Magawa? the show. Yeah, Gabby Magawa. Yeah, I think so. Caleb, hi. Do you work hundreds of feet underground for 72-hour shifts? No. Do you work underground at all? I don't think I've ever worked underground. No. Uh, no. <clears throat> Augustus Link, my dentist used to give us toothpaste with extra fluoride because uh, we lived on well water, which had no added fluoride. I now have stains on my two front teeth. Yeah, that's the... That's the thing. And if you try other tooth powders, you'll see that Matuthine is the, I mean, of the four or five I've tried, it's by far the least granular. It's also the least salty. I should probably order some at some point. Oh, I'll send you some. Will you text me your address? Sure. I Googled around, and um, that's always the concern of dentists, that it's too uh, abrasive, but there's no evidence of it. Zero. You go, it's like I Googled and Googled and Googled and Googled. Everyone who does it just loves it. Uh, get a podcast with Jason Hopper, Dallin Pepper, and Taylor before the quarterfinals. It will be a fun podcast with these legends. Oh, hold on. Let me write that down. Hold on, Myrone. Okay. Uh, okay, got it. Uh, okay. Uh, I noticed you forgot Colton. Uh, fuck Colton, right? No Colton. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Uh, thank you. So, these fucking people in the comments. Someone's like, hey, you should record the event first and then play it so people can't see their scores. Oh, yeah. Great idea. Record it first. That's really cool. Douche nozzles. Dude, leave it. Leave it all to me. No more advices from anyone. <clears throat> You want to send me something? If you have any advice, send me a picture of a, a wart on your penis. I'll diagnose it for you. And listen, all you people who have sick kids out there, don't just don't work. Just leave. Just it's fine. Sniffly. If your kid has any cold symptoms, he's fine. I was thinking about the other day. That guy just has one kid, so that's why he was being like that. It's like that's dude, what I was thinking too. Yeah. Whenever we've had, whenever I would see parents bring their kids in. It was their first kid, and it was just same kind of symptoms, just sniffly and runny nose. I took cough. my kids to a tennis tournament yesterday, got them all dressed. Ari, we get there, and Ari's like, dude, my stomach is fucked up. I'm like, it is? He's like, yeah. He's seven, right? And I'm like, all right, what are you going to do? And he's like, I already told you I can't play. I'm like, well, warm up with me. He's like, dude, I do not feel good. I'm going to go lay in the sun. And he's seven. I'm like, all right, dude, I trust you. I love you. And my other two boys were not feeling good too, but they're just out there playing and, and they're a little further along in the sickness. And, um, so the guy next to me is a parent and he's got this one kid, right? And this, this guy like is the guy who, whenever I get to, uh, whenever I see him, he always shows me a picture of my, his kid. He's like, look, here's my kid in karate. Look, here's my kid in baseball here. So he just, he's so proud of his kid. And you can tell both parents like hover on the kid. Right. Yeah. And he's, and, and he's, he's, a, he's a great kid. I mean, it's just, but it's just the typical two parents, one kid, you know, he's everything to them. And it's like, so he's like, oh, your kids aren't feeling well. I'm like, nah, they've been vomiting and this and that and this. And he right away goes, have you taken them in to have them checked? And I'm like, that's when it clicked for me. Take them in to have them checked. He doesn't got gonorrhea. Right. You know what I mean? Not bleeding out of his asshole. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, what the fuck? What are you talking about? My parents still do that to my to my younger brother. So just, he needs to get checked. Yeah, like we'll be on like a full blown vacation, right? Like we're we're going to Disney World, and he's like, "Yeah, my throat kind of scratchy." He's like, we need to go to urgent care. Let's go right now. Like, we need to go. I'm like, yeah. dude, I'm at fucking Disney World. <laughs> I want to go. I'm gonna fucking build a lightsaber and ride some rides. I'm not gonna go spend half a day in an urgent care because Michael's got a sore throat. My, I shouldn't, my, I hope my mom's not listening. One of my kids, oh, uh, 
he, he talked funny and um not even funny he didn't even talk he didn't even talk funny he just talked different and I, I don't even know how to describe it and at one point my mom's like hey man you need to take him to a speech therapist and then like a month later she's like you need to take him to a speech therapist and like a month later she's like you need to take him to a speech therapist and i didn't tell her this but the whole time i'm thinking that's just gonna fuck my kid up even more yeah, right. Like I just I, knew, like I just used my own discernment and now it's been two years and he's the fucking most articulate, easiest to understand, most chatty Kathy, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Plug your ears, Rosemary. Yeah. But, but and I'm, and I'm not upset at my mom for telling me that, but that's her generation. You know what I mean? Like, I know that it's like, for sure. Like, I like I play both sides of it. Okay. I'm going to take him there. Now it's going to, he's going to think he's a tard. Exactly. He's going to immediately be like, hey, why do I got to do the fucking... The He's going to have shit. a complex. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. like, shit, I had to go to speech therapy the first five years of my life. Yeah, fuck that. I ain't like... I told my... But I did think... To, I did actually think of this. When my mom recommended it, I was like, oh, maybe I should get him... This is seriously where I went with this. Maybe I should get him singing lessons. So that way, he doesn't know that he's working on his, you know, uh, pronunciation of words or his, you yeah. know, the, the, you know, or paying attention to how his mouth works. You know, I did think that. Have you seen the King's speech? It's kind of a silly movie, but I think I saw it. I thought it was going to be great. It's at the very end, like he's a stammering moron, and then he fucking gives like the greatest speech of all time. Was that Winston Churchill? Who was that? The King's speech? Who was the? Guy? I don't think it was Winston Churchill, but was it? Oh. Um, anyway, he that's kind of how they fixed his speech was it through singing. Oh, they did. Okay, yeah. I did see that movie. Maybe subconsciously that's why I said it, but probably not. I'm the... probably not. I'm a genius. King I'm, pra I'm a practical genius. See, you probably just did it all yourself. Played some music, got them singing some Tupac, and now they can speak like geniuses. Um, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Do you have day sex? Yeah. You do? Yeah. I had day sex yesterday. How was it? It was fucking great. It's always great, but it was just, it was, you know what I mean? It was like. It's weird in the middle of the day, isn't it? Yeah. Like you expect it to happen at night. Because you're like, well, it's just, or in the morning, but just yeah, day yeah. sex is just weird. Yeah. Like, but, now, what do I do with the rest of my day? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. That's what my wife said. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was kind of tapped after that. Damn. Okay. Well, <laughs> hey, I'm like, I'm going to take a nap. It turns into day sex. And now I'm, now I don't want to take a nap. I'm ready to go do shit. I'm fired up. Yeah. It's like Vicodin. Some people, it makes them relax, but I'm like ready to go. Yeah. I get that. You just but, want um, something after that. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to do Fran with Vicodin. This isn't going to hurt as much. Uh, but um, but my wife's like, my wife was about to go like the Pilates or something. She's like, this is going to be weird. She's like, why? She's like, I'm done. <laughs> that, that was my Pilates. I think I'm going to go take a nap now. Oh, Jess T, uh, I have day sex more often than night sex. Yeah, wow. I mean, when I was had fucking nothing going, when I didn't have three kids, yeah, I mean, it was just like, yeah, it's so much easier, right? Uh, day sex, yes. Butt sex, no. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it shouldn't even be called sex when the butt's involved. It's just a pathology at that point. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like butt sex. Yeah. I, I, hey, Jake. This then you have to make the bed again. That and that. You know what's funny is I'm 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 running out of the room to like go celebrate my day sex in the gym or something. Uh, I, I looked back in the bedroom. My wife was making the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, honey. Oh, shit. And I did. I, I had a, uh, here we go, Corey. Guys, you guys know. A mid sex is great, better than C4 for re-energizing. Yeah. But I did right after that go take a, uh, I had uh, some, uh, what's that shit that Andrew Hiller got me into? You, you, you put a scoop of it in water. And I'll explode. And I'll explode. I put that shit on subscription and got like a, a 30 day like amount sent to me every 30 days. And now I have like, but I don't take it. I, now I have like yeah. five bottles of it. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck happened here? I guess I'm not very consistent. I had the, I had the condoms on a subscription from Amazon. I had to cancel that. I was like, I was trying yeah. to make it. Oh, too many. I'm falling I'm 52. I'm falling way behind. <laughs> I, I, I looked in the drawer yesterday. I'm like, dude, there's four boxes of condoms in here. Because usually I just reach around in there and pull one out. Yeah. But I looked yesterday because it's daytime. I could see in there. I'm going to need one. Yeah. 
anyway. That's it. I don't want to talk about anything personal. You think that guy still listens to the podcast, Dan, or he didn't have time for that shit now? I don't know. He said he listened uh, to Snoozes last week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. He does. Yeah. I would. Uh, he probably is one of those that picks and chooses. You know, he sees somebody he likes and wants to listen to it. Totally oh, oh. This is some uh, double up. Use two condoms at a time. Not a bad idea. Uh, what's a condom? Uh, geez, Louise. Uh, condoms are gay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so later on today, we'll do a weekend, uh, Dave Castro weekend review. Does he have something up yet? Mm, I don't know. Let me look. The su By the way, if you guys don't subscribe to the Subclips channel, you should. There's a lot of good shit on there. Um, I think I can put a link to it. No. No, nothing up yet. Okay. I think that's a link to the subclip station. Either that or that's to my personal email. <laughs> Everybody check. That guy Dusty's doing an incredible job on the subclip station. Yeah, they're pretty good, right? And I just I like the thumbnails. I don't know. I don't watch the clips, but the thumbnails are dope. That's yeah, I agree. And the Tyson Bajant video is cut caught on fire. Is it yeah? Eleven thousand views is crazy for the subclip station. Twelve thousand. How do I know if I subscribe to that? Um, you go there, and then there's a button somewhere. Where is it? It's not going to be there because you're on the profile. Here, I'll show you. Oh. oh, shit. So so I sent them. Oh, I fucking probably sent you something to the back end. Oh, there. Thank you. If you look up Sevon Pod, the Sevon Podcast Clips on YouTube, it's the yellow logo, not the white one. Look at Saxon Panchik on Leaving Proven. That's like the number one. That has 57,000 views. Jesus Christ. That's wow. the, that's our wow. That's cool. I wonder if um uh Let me see something here. Um Santa Cruz Toyota. My my van's been in the shop forever. That's not really cool, yeah. is it? No. Dang. You think they said it would be Friday? The very best service. This call may be recorded. They said it would be Friday or Saturday. It's Monday, dude. And it's like eight thousand dollars. Welcome to Santa Cruz Toyota. For quality of service, this call may be recorded. Oh, I know. To view a copy of our privacy policies, visit SantaCruzToyota.com/slash privacy. For the service department, press one. Art. So. I think my dude's name is Pablo. Was it? Pablo. Pablo? It's been no, so long I forgot. I think you're right. I told my wife I would do this when the show's over. I'm so glad you guys are doing it with me. It's easier with you guys here. It's like I'm doing my chores and you're like in the room with me. You have reached the service department. We apologize that an associate is not immediately available. Please leave a message and we will return your call. Hi, this is Sevon Matosian. I'm calling to speak with Pablo. Uh, I dropped my van off last week. Um, I don't, I don't remember what I had done with it, but it was going to be expensive, like 8,000 bucks. And um, it was supposed to be done Friday or Saturday, and I haven't heard from you guys. Could someone give me a call? The phone number is 805-252. Thank you. Bye. I need to call the carpet guy. You want to call him now? I'll hang out with you if you want to call him. No, it's okay. Okay. He's going to give me a fucking absurd quote, and I'm going to have to tell him I'm not doing that, and I'll do it myself. You're going to put down, like, the, the padding underneath it and then lay it down and have a staple gun and all that? Yeah, that's probably what I'll do. It's not a very big room, which is kind of nice, but it's just I've never laid carpet before, so it'll be interesting.
All right. That's it. Uh, see you guys. Uh, um, uh, um, oh, darn it. Damn. <clears throat> text news to the uh, phone, the work phone. Let me see if the, no one's ever texted me any nudes. One person, um, one person texted me a picture of their body one time, and it, it, it still to, it stained my brain. Really? Oh, please point me in the right direction so I can get a Sevon podcast sticker. Oh, oh shit! Here we go! Here we go! Pablo. Hi, um, I was just calling because I had a missed call from this number. Oh yeah, hi! I was calling to speak with Pablo. Okay, um, he is actually not here today. Okay, my car was supposed to be ready Friday or Saturday, and I haven't heard from anyone. Could you check um, to see if it's ready? Yeah, give me one moment. Okay, thank you. One day we got to pull up this, this chick's Instagram. She is like an 18-time coleslaw wrestling champion. They wrestle in coleslaw? In coleslaw. It's like just a massive tarp, like the size of a big old wrestling mat. And they just cover it in cabbage and oil. And then they wrestle each other. I want to sit. Okay, thank you. It better be ready, Judy. I got shit I got to do today. Santa Cruz Toyota Service, how can I help you? Hi, this is Sevon. Um, I think my van was supposed to be ready on Friday or Saturday, and I haven't heard from anyone, so I wanted to check in. And I guess Pablo's uh, doesn't work today, so I'm just looking for someone to help me. Yeah, let me put you on hold, and I'll check for you. One second. <clears throat> Thank you. He didn't even need my name. You said your name. Oh, Hi, he did? Sevon. Oh. My last name? My phone number? Social? All right, I'm back. Yep, it is done. It looks like the, there's a note on the repair that they tried calling you Friday night. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's ready to go, and it's all cleaned up for you. Oh, you demand. Okay, well, do you know the final cost on the bill? Jesus. What was that? Jesus criminy. I don't even know if I'm on hold or what now. Yeah, I don't know what just happened. Is that really loud when I do that? No, no. Not too bad. Gotta hate hold music. <laughs> Looks like the balance is six thousand seven hundred and seventy five dollars and fifty one cents. All right, I'll fill the duffel bag up with uh rolls of quarters and be on down. See you then. Thanks, buddy. Bye. Tried calling me Friday. You have a fucking app you made me sign up for. What's the point? You of made me. App? You sent me a fucking quote on a fucking app with a fucking link. I didn't get to talk to anyone. I had to be, accept seventy two hundred dollars, and now you're telling me you tried to call me on fucking Friday. How about send me a fuck? How about send it through the fucking app you made me sign up for? We have a new system in place. I fucking felt my back go out right there. <laughs> I've been sitting around with my fucking thumb in my ass with no fucking car since Friday. But look, you got day sex out of it, so. Yeah, you're right. Maybe if I would have had both cars operational, I'd have been somewhere. That's a good point. God, you're so optimistic. You're a good wingman. <laughs> That's crazy, though. Hiller says you should have just bought a new one. Oh, shut the fuck up. Uh, uh, Sarah told me I should never fucking buy a car, only lease. She she basically said retards buy cars. They don't know how to do their taxes. Dang, I'm is that paraphrasing. The That's she's the like thing the, to do. She's like the third richest person I know, too. It's like, uh, hey. the fuck. Hi, oh. sweetheart. What? Hi. Um, Hi. The car is ready. Do you think you could drive me down there, or do, should I walk down there? Uh, no, I can drive you down. McKenna's here with the boys. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. I'll be inside cool. in a couple minutes. I love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Sixty-seven fucking hundred dollars.
That's wild. You should have bought a new one. You should fucking blow me. <laughs> Judy, for your van, Sevy. Thank you. The fuck? I knew I should. I, I, I'm feeling defensive because I think Andrew might be right. Oh, here. Sorry, Augustus, for the van. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Augustus. I didn't ignore it. Get out of here. Tell her the cost. <laughs> Great, thanks. She probably knew all right. What are you, a fucking marriage counselor? Sounded like I was from the South for a second. Counselor? Marriage counselor? The fuck are you, Dan? Tell her the cost. Hey, I don't even know. Um, I was thinking about, did you see the comments in there about sharing bank accounts and stuff? Uh, No, but I heard, I heard Dan talking about it, yeah. In the comments? I mean, did you, in the comments or oh. like? No, in the no, comments, there were people like talking about whether people share bank accounts or not. Do people do that? Like, is that a normal thing? I guess I, I, I don't know what the normal thing is. We do. You and your wife just have one account or, or, yeah. um, we, we, my wife and I've never shared a bank account until, but recently because of the Sevon podcast, we started like Sevon Media LLC or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then she hooked up all the accounts. So, like, you can just go on there and see all the accounts oh nice. but all that's done is made me like now i like it's made me like just not want to do anything <laughs> do you know what i mean <laughs> now she got access to it all what the fuck do i need to do nothing oh, yeah 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 i don't want to I like a, like i used to like going in there you know what i mean and sending money for the electrical bill and sending money for the like just through online banking right You're like, but now i'm, I'm like something. what the fuck yeah like you do everything i'm helping yeah i just i don't do nothing yeah. I don't want to do nothing. The fuck do I need money for? She can take care of it all. Yeah. I just spend it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, spicy Marg money. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll be using it for the, for the family van. Oh, thank you. God damn. You guys are. Wow. This is cool. Van repair. It's going to be a good day. Thank you. Dang. Wow. <sighs> Chris Beast for van life. Thank you. God, look at you guys. Van life. Um, my, my wife doesn't though, but you know, what's really is cool about her. So like I came home from the, I came home from the repair shop yeah. on whatever day. Yeah. And I was fucking all fucked up. Right. Right. And I'm like, Hey, I already looked at three new vans. We're buying a new van. I don't give a fuck. I call my mom. I'm going to take her down there to co-sign for me. Nice. <laughs> yeah. my mom's like, and so my mom and, and my wife are like okay no problem whatever you want and they're both like it's gonna be okay i'm like all right i'm fucking just pissed off and then like four hours later i'm just like hey fuck that we're not getting a new van i don't want to fucking like increase registration insurance and monthly payment fuck that and then i call my mom and my wife they're like okay okay but no one's like like if I, i'm so glad i don't like it's just that I got to make, you know what I mean? Like they treat me like I'm an, a, like a big, like an adult. They pretend like I'm an adult and I'm making my own decisions. And you know, they thought that that was going to be the decision anyway. They're I guess I should ask, them. I should ask them. I yeah, should yeah, make yeah, a video yeah, yeah. of my wife and yep. ask her. My wife does the same shit. Like I'll they're not like, even I'm, weighing in. They're just like, all right, all right. Like, like every decision I make is like I'm a genius. But for some reason, on some level, I feel like I'm getting manipulated to fuck. Absolutely. Back. I told my wife <laughs> I was going to buy an air runner and she's like, okay, yeah, we're going to buy an air runner. And then I was like, Mm, I don't think we should buy an air run. <laughs> I'm like, like oh, we need to, we need to put carpet down. We need to get flooring. We need this. And oh, then... some practical things. We need a toilet that flushes without the plunger. I know. Yeah, right, right. right. She's like, yeah, yeah. You, I think you're right. Yeah, it's oh, good. That's a good way. You wanted that. Yeah. And meanwhile, she's calling her friend. Fuck these things with dicks are dumb. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> my husband, my husband's got a fucking 1962 CPU in that brain of his. <laughs> exactly. I know they're great. Master manipulator. Fuck. I used to never do that to my ears. Now I'm getting old. I do all the stuff, all the stuff you see old people doing that you're like, I'll never do that. That's gross. Hey, eventually you just stop caring. It's Yeah. You should see the hat I wear to the beach. It's absurd. Just the, do you wear, is it that big, big straw hat? It's that fucking like the rogue ones. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I just, I, all I need is a, a steel bucket and something that lo- to be looking for money. You know what I mean? A metal detector. <laughs> you know? detector. Dude, I'm so the metal detector looking. A little dude. like litter box shovel yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. It's a fucking. Found a coin. Yeah. It, my kids want that so bad. Those I'm are like, fun. I think it's probably the quickest way to get like a uh, carpal tunnel or tunnel carpal, whatever that thing is yeah. holding that thing, dude. I bet you all those dudes have fucked up elbows and shoulders. Sure. Their shit's fucked. You're just sweeping back and forth, holding on to something at the end of your arm all the time. Yeah, It's like, it's like pretending you have cerebral palsy. It's like one of those crutches, you know, that those people like with the bracelets yeah. on them, it's yeah. like those, but you never get to touch the ground with it. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> You're just carrying a brown pair of crutches that might find you a dime. Exactly. Uh, yeah. If we do make stickers, uh, um, I, I guess maybe like this one, like these, these, this sticker is so thick and durable. This thing will last through a snowstorm. So I don't yeah, know. Those are good stickers. That's the one I have on my laptop and it's like one of the only ones that's not peeling off. Yeah. It's like a forever sticker. I don't know who wants a seven on podcast sticker. I need a haircut. Cut it again. <laughs> maybe four hours and 20 minutes we set the world record yesterday with andrew yeah right mm-hmm. people are dming me telling me it's, it's going to take them three or four days to get through it i can't believe people like the pot the podcast i did with dave or that podcast i thought those were like two of the worst podcasts i've ever done and people loved them <gasps> just, <clears throat> i have no i do not have my finger on the pulse just having a silly goose time yeah how was i the ever the greatest chief marketing officer who ever lived i don't even know shit I don't know what's good or bad. All right. Um, all right. Thanks, you guys, for the help with the van. Appreciate it. Thanks for being nice to Dan. Uh, I'll see you guys later on today. I'll probably go on live with uh, Sousa or Caleb sometime to talk about Dave. Uh, Dave pod- Oh, uh, Dave's podcast, great. Also, Garrett's. Yeah, Gar- I actually enjoyed Garrett's a lot. I hate doing other people's podcasts, but that I actually enjoyed that. Garrett Glinton. Garrett Glinton. Oh, let me see if that real. Let me go over there real quick and see. Glinton Things? Is that the name of her podcast? Yep. Let me see. Uh, let, me, let me check out the comments here and see if, if I'm okay with the guy. Uh, Hopper is Big Bird. Great interview. Great show. I'm going to give these thumbs up. Uh, great interview. I'm a day late, but enjoyed it. First, thank you. Then, if I may, thumbnail on the show was stating the man, the myth, the legend. But to me, the show is more about Sevon's recent podcast fee the brian friend issue than it was about sevon in a way the last 10 minutes were was it planned that way will you make an episode two oh my god a show about sevon's journey the sevon podcast life story and finally i sincerely hope that thousands soon to be two thousands of viewers on the show and also look to other videos keep up the good work jesus crimey write a fucking book this is a terrific conversation. Thanks for sharing. Sevon is probably the most misunderstood guy from CrossFit. At least they got my sex right. That's good. That's Even funny. if I get caught up in his antics and wonder why I've been watching and enjoying his stuff since the day he got to CF. He's a good dude. Period. Love him and love yourself. <clears throat> Sounds like good advice. Uh, Hiller sent me great show. Tyler's amazing and such a good friend and good dude. Oh, okay. I read the rest of these. Oh, oh shit. There's a shitload of comments. Oh, that's cool. Dude, yeah, Garrett looks like she's fucking 12 years old. She does look young. She doesn't even have pores on her skin yet. Look at, we're in a fight here. Look, I'm looking away from her. I'm like, fuck you, bitch. She's like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> Listen to me. Oh, Week in Review just came out. Oh, shit. I just want to see how long it is. The Dave Castro. Paulina is on the pulse. Um, Please be short. 21 minutes for fucks. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Shit. Look, he, I fucking knew it. Seven what? podcast Bible talk. Listed in there as a topic. <clears throat> dude, some dude in the fucking comments is like, thinks that like, he's like, I'm really tired of this Christian stuff from CrossFit. That wasn't even Christian stuff. 
That's he like loves, saying he, I read like what that's as much saying as is like it's boy stuff because there's boys in the Bible or that it's book stuff. I like there wasn't one preachy thing in there. Was there? No, there wasn't. I mean, we're fucking drunk and eating carbs. How about to tear us up for that? You're worried about the fucking Bible for fuck's sake. I'm worried about how, me talking about wine and cheese. Yeah, how tri yeah, how triggered do you have to be by the Bible to think that there was anything uh 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 right wing MAGA nut job Christian psycho nut job about that? I mean, for fuck's sake. <laughs> do a whole, I'm gonna do a whole show like this. You have to. You should you gotta put it on. Yes. No, you gotta put it frontwards. You gotta let everybody know what's going on here. Yeah, like that. That's good. Under my headphones? Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is it. This is it. Oh, it's even Velcro. So good. Oh, my God. MAGA. What? It's even Velcro. I didn't realize it was Velcro. That's awesome. I really think it's an ugly-ass hat, though. It, it's not great. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Trump. My whole outfit today is fucked. Even though no one ever sees my lower section, I'm wearing maroon pants. Oh, my God. I know. It's fucked. It's fucked. I'm going to probably change my shirt before I go to Toyota. I'm not the humble monk that I think I am. <laughs> All right. Cold. This picture, you, so, some people like post a picture of like their titties and it comes back to haunt them. This will probably. Uh, oh, that's getting out. <laughs> it's getting out. No revenue. Those, we'll grab those MAGA guys. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, shit. Here we go. My wife's. Great aunt was wearing the same Trump hat yesterday, completely unironically. Amazing. Today's a big day for Trump. Today's the day they might seize his shit. Oh boy. Hey, w w I'll, let's. I want to show you something fucking crazy I heard yesterday. A Bernie Madoff defrauded billions. Do you guys know who Bernie Madoff is? Um. Dave, uh, 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 David Sheehan, chief counsel to trustee Picard, stated on September 27th, 2009. Okay, you ready for this? About $36 billion was invested into his scam, returning $18 billion to investors, investors with $18 billion missing. Whoa. So Bernie Madoff ran a Ponzi scheme that defrauded people out of eighteen. billion billion dollars holy shit when he went to court and he had to make his appeals he had to pay 10 million dollars okay 10 i think that's right 10 million okay. um uh made off appeal let me see uh um 10 uh 10, 10 million um, judge, I think the judge. Okay, Bernie Madoff's lawyers are appealing the judge's decision to revoke his ten million dollars bail. Okay. <laughs> now listen, Donald Trump borrowed money from a bank, paid the money back to the bank with interest. Then years later, the attorney general, this Letitia James lady, said that when he he lied on his loan documents. And in order to just appeal that decision, he has to put up $500 million. The bank never complained. Not, no one ever complained and no one was defrauded. Just think about that for a second. Holy. He fuck. lied on his bank loan is the, is the accusation of what he was found guilty of. And the fine is $500 million. The bank never complained. He paid the bank back in loan. No one was defrauded. Oh, what's this say, Olivia? Not anymore. It's 175 million. I mean, either way, this is fucking nuts. That's like another thing. Like, how are you? New York Appeals Court reduces Trump bond in a civil fraud case to 175 million. It's still, it's still it's just um, it doesn't even make any fucking sense. It doesn't it doesn't even like make any sense. 
And by the way, she ran on the platform for years. She, by the way, when she took office, she was worth a hundred thousand dollars. Now she's worth fifteen million dollars. And she ran. Um, she ran for attorney general uh, on the uh, notion that she was going to fuck um, Trump. I don't even follow Donald Trump on um, Instagram. Now I do. Trump. Yeah, what the hell? Supposed to follow all your supporters. How has he not been on this show? Such bullshit. I don't know. More, so close. more more views on Tyson Bajan, uh sub clip. It's crazy pouring in. If anyone says anything bad about him in the comments, there, I just attack their moms. Thank you, Olivia, for that. You know what I mean? Yes. I've noticed people comment back. And he's like. You're not even providing an articulate co counter argument or something like that. Well, fu I fucked your mom. It's like, thank dude, you. Yeah. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're not even. You're not even giving me a legitimate argument. He's not as good as you think he is. Yeah, but your mom is. <laughs> That's not yeah. what your mom said. Dang, Kenneth. Oh, they're working on the skate ramp. I think my neighbors. Oh, Kenneth, send me uh, your address. I'll send you a Slack block. block. I think it's crazy. You got to talk your wife into doing that. Hey, send me. I have it. I have like five of them in my garage. Send me your address somehow. If you have my phone number, text it to me. I'll send you one. <laughs> Jeffrey Birchfield, how to make friends and influence people. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked your mom. After the football team. You did? Sorry. No, I didn't say anything bad about her. All right. Don't forget to get your Matufian. Um, oh, the tennis tournament was wild. Wild. Absolutely wild. It's a whole nother story. I don't even know if I'm prepared to, to share it. It was wild. Is the evolution in my parenting yesterday for sure, and in my relationship with with my son? Last night was crazy. Last night we talked for in bed for like an hour about God. It was wild, but it all stemmed from some shit that happened at the at the at the uh, tennis tournament. I had to explain to him that he's, I had to explain to my nine-year-old son yesterday that, you know how he puts on, I said, if you didn't wear a costume on Halloween and walk around, uh, would you get candy? He goes, no. He goes, you got to put on a costume, ring the doorbell and you get candy. I go, yeah. I go, that's what Avi is to the world. He goes, what do you mean? I'm like, you're not really Avi. You just put that, you, we, we put that. He's like, but you name me. I'm like, I know that's the Halloween costume I bought you for this lifetime. He's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. His shit got all fucking exploded. He's like, what the fuck? I'm like, yeah, we just arbitrary. I, he goes, so you're not really Sevon? I go, not really. I go, but it's good costume for this life. I'm rolling with it. <clears throat> it's like, so who am I really? I'm like, yeah, that's the fucking question. It's too early for me to try to comprehend that. And if you're not a pussy, you'll find out. And then you'll know God. He's like, oh. He was but that led to a fucking great conversation. What the fuck? I told, told him, hey, don't worry. Most people don't even get there for they die. They don't even know it till they die. Don't worry. You're ahead of the curve. <laughs> Bernie Gannon kids have enough problems with identity. <laughs> <laughs> I go, listen, I go, you just keep I go, don't worry, you just keep building Avi till you're like 19 or 20. Then it won't be enough for you, and you'll look for something deeper. Until then, we we'll just just keep building on the Avi costume. He's like, "All right." He's like, "I don't really understand this shit." I'm like, "I know, me neither." But just tell me. <laughs> hey, clock. Do I know you? Like, have we had lunch before? Like, have we hung out? Have we ever driven in a car together? Yeah, remember Todd Marinovich? I do. Who's that? <clears throat> he was this redheaded dude. His dad it was like going to make him like the greatest quarter, but the greatest quarterback who ever lived. And he was on pace and then he got into fentanyl and heroin. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was he was a special kid. Yeah, he's old now. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if I know clock. Clock knows too much. There's some people who just know too much. Too much ski. Hmm. Mary Jovanovich. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, I'll see you guys later on today for the Dave Castro Weekend Review of the Review of the Weekend Review. Uh, don't forget to go over and support Dave at TDC Mercantile. If you're going to try something over there, get the um, garlic olive oil. It's really good. And made just down the street from my house. All right. Love you guys. Bye-bye.